instantaneously helpful. And we kept in touch over time. And then in June, June. of 16, mm -hmm. we sat down to have kind of a networking lunch and a lot sparked from there. I went away from that conversation unbeknownst to her, inspired to write the initial business plan and strategy for what is now Somersault. And six months later, and tried to hire her agency and turns out um, she wasn't taking on new clients. But as luck would have it, the two ran into each other at a bar in New York City. I had been kind of marching towards launch, had the deck and the line sheet with me and literally cornered her and said, let's look at this. And Jill, when we say Lori cornered me, this is absolutely not an exaggeration. Like a literal, she literally cornered Literally me. cornered me. <laughs> and we went through everything. And for me, it was like, ding, ding, ding. Like this is exactly what I had been waiting for. I asked her if she wanted a co-founder on the spot. And she said, Yes, let's talk about it. They both got to work, meeting every weekend determined to design a sustainable brand focused on body inclusivity and diversity. Bathing suit shopping, I think I speak for most women that no matter how good of shape you feel in or don't feel in, it's just the lighting in the room, the shopping, it's just an exhausting experience. So what white space did you see and that made you say, okay, somersault is different? Really, no one was owning truly designer quality swimwear for an affordable price point. We also used 10,000 women's body scans and 1.5 million measurements of real women to create our fit. When you think about swimwear for the last, you know, 40, 50 years, it was really all about just one view of what women should be, whereas we're all so different. Like I'm an immigrant from India, Lori grew up in Missouri. So we wanted to create a brand that truly reflected the diverse community of women that needed swimwear. In just five months, with more than $600,000 in initial investments, Lori and Reshma launched Somersault in May 2017. But raising capital had its challenges. We have a spreadsheet of like 100 people who just said no over and over and over again. We've raised over $26 million to date, and you know, the rest is really history. Today, Somersault is thriving and growing, now expanding to sleepwear and loungewear. What is it like to see women walking around in your clothing. Honestly, Jill, if anyone wears somersault, we are just thrilled. We have moms who are like, oh my gosh, I haven't put on a swimsuit in so long and I'm so excited. And it is such a milestone every time. And every time we get one of those photos, whether it's from the customer. Never or gets old. It never, it, it it never absolutely gets absolutely never gets old. Lori and Rishma also told me Somersault is launching its third installment of their flagship size inclusivity campaign called Everybody is a Somersault Body, featuring 27 inspiring women. They also have six limited edition collaborations launching this summer, a host of new colors across its collection, as well as brand new styles. Can't wait. Up next, from jewelry and personalized accessories to empowering workouts, I've got four small businesses to make you look and feel your best this summer. The midterms are here. It's time to plan your vote. We'll provide everything you need to know to successfully cast your ballot. Just select any state you want to learn about for the primary or general election, and you'll instantly get voting rules, see the next big deadline, and learn how to take action for your plan. Voting rules have changed since 2020, and those rules vary from state to state. So it's time to get planning for 2022. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. It's a can't-miss summer on today. They are walking strong, elegant, and pretty easy to prepare. How to cut costs on your vacation. Vicki has the answers. Every single thing you need for the best summer yet. Only on Today. Hallie Jackson Now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now.
Welcome back. Now I have four fabulous women who can help us get summer ready. And who doesn't love summer jewelry? We know Chari Cutbrook does. She created her own personalized jewelry business by Chari with just $100 in her bank account. Take a look. My grandmother Colleen had the most interesting jewelry. That's probably where my fascination for jewelry and deep appreciation for sentimental pieces began. After leaving my corporate job at 28, I was burnt out and had no idea what I was going to do next. A few months later, I moved to Hawaii and decided to focus on turning my passionate hobby for jewelry into a career. So with $100, no formal training, and a lot of ambition, by Shari was born. Over the next four years, I grew the brand by expanding into fine and personalized jewelry and used Instagram as a launch pad to reach customers all over the world. But it was a customized gift for my best friend Rocky Barnes that would change the focus and structure of the company. The Space Latte Necklace was born, and it's now one of our most popular selling items. I love that every word, name, or letter they choose has a memory, story, or sentimental meaning behind it. Expanding a small business meant taking a deep breath and a big leap, so I packed up and headed back to Los Angeles. I now have a team of five diverse and incredibly talented women. Each time someone opens a Baishari box and puts on a piece of my jewelry and feels special because of it, it's a job and a dream brought to life. Such beautiful pieces and a beautiful story after being featured on our show back in 2020. Baichari had their biggest day in sales, surpassing profits made on days like Black Friday. Wow. And at the 2020 Democratic National Convention, former First Lady Michelle Obama wore their vote necklace. How cool is that? They've also got some new collections like these pieces inspired by the Hawaiian Summer Beautiful. Aren't they great? All right, now I want you to meet Kylie Kaufman, a woman whose family inspired her to build a business while giving back, one baby step at a time. It all started in June 2015 when my niece Charlotte was born with an extra chromosome, also known as Down syndrome. As a first time aunt, I wanted to get her something special. I created a monogram keepsake box filled with baby items. This was the basis for my first business, Rock-A-Box Baby, which I launched in 2017. Fast forward to when the pandemic hit. Charlotte was struggling, she was high risk for COVID, having trouble with virtual learning, and lost her socialization and routine. Inspired to help her and others with special needs, I rebranded, expanded my product offerings to include a new jewelry line, and committed to give back 15% of profits each month to an organization that supports Down syndrome and special needs. On October 1st, 2020, Lot 321 launched. Lot comes from the name Charlotte and 321 is an ode to three copies of the 21st chromosome. Business is booming and one day I hope Charlotte takes over. And get this, Charlotte is turning seven next month. Happy birthday, Charlotte. Lot 321 sales skyrocketed in the days following our segment, airing with people emailing charity suggestions, which has helped the company expand their impact nationwide. And since then, they've donated tens of thousands of dollars to Down syndrome and special needs awareness. This month, they are working with Sandal Gap Studio. How wonderful and beautiful is that? All right, you know what else is synonymous with summer? Weddings, I know more than anyone. And it was her own wedding that sparked a life-changing idea for entrepreneur, Teddy Lightman. My name is Teddy Lightman. After getting engaged in 2017, I was on a mission to find a unique gift for my bridesmaids. When I couldn't find something memorable yet affordable, I took matters into my own hands. Using my background in fashion, I sourced and created the perfect one-of-a-kind acrylic clutch and my bridesmaids were thrilled. Right away, I realized I was onto something. I started a side hustle out of my small apartment, creating bags for friends and family. When I was laid off from my day job in 2018, I was devastated, but saw a silver lining. The opportunity to develop and grow my handbag company full time. In July 2018, I officially launched Ray of Light, a customizable accessories company that specializes in perfect gifts for all occasions. These bags are a triumph. I actually wore my Jill bag this past weekend. And right after the segment first aired, Ray of Light had thousands of people on their website at once, over 3,000. They have since launched several new customizable products, all under $100. 
That's things like tote bags, hats, and kids' bags, among others. And it just continues to grow. We love to hear that. All right, summertime and getting outdoors inspires a lot of us to get moving. And that's what this next entrepreneur is all about. Megan Rope's company is all about empowering women and helping them dance their way to happiness. I was a recent graduate from NYU's Tisch Dance Program, performing for the MBA's Brooklynettes and still feeling a little lost. I started teaching dance-based fitness as a side hustle and immediately knew it was what I was meant to do. In March of 2017, I took a leap of faith, launched the Sculpt Society, and started teaching in-person classes. A fun, effective workout for dancers and non-dancers alike. At first, if I had two people in my class, it was a good day, but I gave it my all every time. Through word of mouth, my class grew. A handful of celebrities and Victoria's Secret models even became regulars. In November of 2019, the Sculpt Society app went live, giving users around the world access to live and on-demand classes from their homes. Whether five minutes or 50, dance, sculpt, yoga, or meditation, there is something for everyone. To see my community grow and dance together has been the most rewarding part of my career. Well, we all got used to these during the pandemic. And since the pandemic, the Sculpt Society hosted their first digital retreat last year with over 2,000 participants. They were also able to connect with their community in real life with events in New York, Boston, Chicago, and L.A. Tickets sold out in less than 20 minutes. And each stop had over 100 attendees. The Sculpt Society is gearing up for their second in-person tour this summer in more cities across the U.S. and Canada. All right, coming up, we're not done working up a sweat. We have two women who do it all. One feel-good workout at a time. Stick around. We'll be right back. Uvalde, Texas, a small town that has become yet another landmark. How long do you think it took for all this damage to occur? Can you tell us what, what it was like? With our NBC News exclusive... Cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, top story with Tom Hamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. The midterms are here. It's time to plan your vote. We'll provide everything you need to know to successfully cast your ballot. Just select any state you want to learn about for the primary or general election, and you'll instantly get voting rules, see the next big deadline, and learn how to take action for your plan. Voting rules have changed since 2020, and those rules vary from state to state. So it's time to get planning for 2022. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. It's a can't-miss summer on today. They are walking strong, elegant, and pretty easy to prepare. How to cut costs on your vacation. Vicki has the answers. Every single thing you need for the best summer yet. Only on today. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Who is this? Welcome back to our Get Ready for Summer edition of She Made It. And these next two entrepreneurs bring the summer energy all year round. Back in 2020, I spoke to J.C. Lambros and Danielle D'Angelo, two former Radio City Rockettes who do it all while building a community of powerful women. Take a look. We weren't great friends. We were more acquaintances, I would call it. But now she's like a appendage. There we go. (laughs) Right. Right. (laughs) J.C. Lambros and Danielle D'Angelo's friendship kicked up when they shared the stage as Radio City Rockettes 12 years ago. Today, they are the co-founders behind Jane Do, a women's fitness brand that's on a mission to foster a community of confident women through their curated feel-good workouts. 
So tell me about Jane Do. So we like to say Jane is every woman and Do is her call to action. So the idea is that we want women to build strength in the studio and then use it outside the studio to do incredible things where it actually matters. This is more about wellness and being your own best friend. And we focus on the gains rather than the losses. It's a message they've carried with them since leaving the Rockettes. After the season was over, JC found herself figuring out her next step. I had this incredible passion for fitness. I saw a void in the local market in Jersey City. I knew we could build off that, and I knew I couldn't do it alone. Without any business experience, JC put together a plan and showed Danielle, who was immediately on board. I was really excited to jump back into our passion for dance and also fuse it with our love of fitness. And just six weeks later, the pair launched their fitness business. But there was one problem. Their studio was far from ready. We saw the ceiling coming down on top of us. I think that was a moment literally, that we literally, literally, literally crumbles. Danielle took down. a broom and she hit the ceiling and it came falling down. And it came falling down. That didn't stop JC and Danielle from moving forward. It gave us the opportunity to do some pop-up classes, which we encourage anyone that is getting started or has any hiccups in their business plan to find a creative way to then turn it into a positive. They built a loyal following of 150 clients before their doors finally opened eight months later. I can't hear you. Yeah. With a combined $40,000 in savings, the former Rockettes self-funded their brand. There's no venture capitalist behind this. This is money that you saved from when you were a Rockettes that you put back in the business and continue to just put it back in the business. Every dime we make goes we put back, back in the business. We've cashed out our 401ks. These doers owe their success to being resourceful. Scrapping. We're the scrappiest broads you'll ever meet. So, right. What does that mean to you, scrapping? It means flipping couches to get stuff done. If you told me five years today, it would be plunging the toilets, we'd be painting the walls, but nobody else is gonna do it if you don't do it yourself. So now you have five studios. Five studios. A lot of toilets to plunge. <laughs> <laughs> and in just five years, their risks have paid off. With studios in New Jersey and New York, an average of 3,000 Janes visit each week. And this Jane is ready for a workout. All right, I'm all Janes out. Let's do this. Am I a Jane? It's official, you're a Jane. I'm a Jane. Welcome to the team. Yay. Well, since we spoke to JC and Danny, they celebrated their grand opening at Jane Do Charleston. They also launched Jane Do Digital, where you can work out with Jane anytime, anywhere. And their family is also growing. JC and her husband, Anthony, welcome their daughter, Lenny, on February 14th, Valentine's Day. Oh, look at that adorable baby. All right, coming up, three women-owned small businesses that will help you get vacation ready. Stay with us. And good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. Welcome back to you today. We've got a lot to celebrate on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody's good, and that's it! We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Man, is this... The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. 
Welcome back. I'm so jazzed because now we even have more brands from female founded companies that I'm excited to share with you on my She Made It It list. I'm bringing you three fabulous businesses with amazing summer staples to get you ready for the warmer months. Okay, let's start with Sea Star Beachwear. Now, Sea Star Beachwear was founded in 2015 by Libby Fitzgerald. After she spent over 20 years raising her family, she started her own company. When Libby was vacationing with her teenage boys in the Caribbean, she was wearing flimsy, unattractive water shoes, and her boys were quick to call her out. Course. Ultimately, she saw a white space in the market for a well-made water shoe that combines fashion and function. Sea Star has reimagined the traditional espadrille designs with breathable, quick-drying neoprene upper and a protective rubber sole. Their shoes easily transition from ocean swimming to rocky beaches or rainy city pavement, and they dry in 15 minutes. I wear these. They have great ones. I have ones that say L-O and then V-E. Super fun. All right. Next up, some summer beverages, courtesy of Tipsy Lady Cocktails. They were founded by Caribbean American and Charleston resident Tony Gilliard. As a black female entrepreneur, Tony prides herself on tipping the scales in the alcohol industry towards female ownership, hence her company name, and has pledged to donate a percentage of all profits to youth entrepreneurs' HIP programs with a focus on diversity. Tony previously spent 17 years as a lawyer and real estate agent before she was compelled to create her own natural, organic, and eco-friendly canned cocktail line with a strong emphasis on style, femininity, elegance, and authenticity. Tipsy ladies ready to drink Caribbean-inspired cocktails celebrate heritage, culture, and spice. Tipsy Lady cocktails are available for shipping in select U.S. states. Delicious. All right, last but definitely not least, we have a very popular brand, Therese. Therese is a fashion lifestyle brand that specializes in vibrant, high-performance activewear and everyday styles for girls and women. How cute is this? Founded in New York City by Zara Therese Tisch to spread joy and positivity, Therese celebrates connection, heart, and female empowerment. Through flashy and dynamic leggings, sports bras, biker shorts, loungewear, and beyond. Therese has over 530 products on the site and is sold at retailers such as Nordstrom, Neiman Marcus, Shopbop, and Amazon. Zara originally launched Therese in 2008 in her New York City parents' basement with handbags. A mother of three kids and a forever optimist, Zara is a ball of energy with a vibrant creative streak and believes in embracing life to the fullest. If you follow her on Instagram, you'll get that instantly. How much fun is that? Well, that is all, unfortunately, for She Made It, and I think we are ready for summer. Thanks for watching, and remember to shop all these small businesses. Scan the QR code at the bottom of the screen or head over to today.com slash shop. I'm Jill Martin, and I will definitely see you next time. When you think Texas, you think beef, brisket, and barbecue. But here in Austin, the state's capital, there's so much more than that. We've got folks and chefs from all around the world who are putting their mark on this city's culinary scene. And in fact, the spices and traditions that pay homage to their families are making Austin a hot food scene. It's really kind of this melting pot of different people, their culture, and their food. The creativity and, and the flavor that they put into the food is really artistry, right? It's really the diversity of food. Like, you can get some of everything here. So what keeps Austin weird and tasty? We're about to find out. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. Austin is home to over 1,200 food trucks in food parks just like this one. But we're here for one specific truck. We're here for Tony's Jamaican, serving up fine Caribbean fare to Austin for more than 10 years. Meet food truck owner Tony Scott and his wife Kim. 
From humble beginnings in Kingston, Jamaica, Tony has made Austin his home since 2003, and he has always had a passion for flavorful food. When did you start cooking? How young were you? 10. Tony's mother, Hyacinth, taught her sons how to be self-sufficient, especially in the kitchen. So you learned from mom early on? Yes. What was it about cooking that you liked? I don't know, I like food, I don't know. <laughs> Those skills learned during childhood would help Tony define his career. For nearly a decade, he worked a small beachside business, serving jerk chicken and drinks to tourists in Jamaica. But after 9-11, tourism to the island stalled. So Tony moved to the U.S. in search of better opportunities, eventually landing in Austin. With construction booming in the state capital, Tony quickly found a job as a painter, but it was his homemade lunches that reignited an idea. You're working, you're, you bring in Jamaican food that you made, some of your friends taste and say, where'd this I, come from? I, yes, I cook my own food, you know, and they were like, oh, you should, you know, open a restaurant. And it's been 10 years. 10 years now. The 60-year-old chef opened Tony's Jamaican food truck in March of 2012. And his wife, Kim, has been one of his biggest supporters since the very beginning. What was the first meal he cooked for? Curry chicken and rice. And he invited me over. And once I had it, I didn't want to ask for more. You know how ladies are. We try to eat a little bit, maybe the salad kind of thing. Don't want them to know that we that greedy. But it was so good, I asked for seconds. So when Tony says, I want to do a food truck, your reaction? I said, a what? I said, a food what? And I knew nothing about food trucks or however, so it was just all his idea. I just followed along. He said he wanted to do something. He had a vision. I said, OK, let's try it. Despite high praise from friends and family for his grub, Tony's business wasn't exactly booming from the start. When you first opened up, was it successful right away? <laughs> no. <laughs> I, I came out here 10 o'clock in the morning, and I was all here until 3 o'clock the next oh, morning. Man. I make $37. Wow. And, you know, I was still happy when I go home, and she was like, how much money do you make? And I was like, $37. And she break out laughing. <laughs> and I was like, don't worry about it. And next day I come and I make fifty seven dollars and the next day I make eighty something dollars and I say okay I'm seeing increase. Tony taking advantage of the South by Southwest crowds that flocked to Austin in early March. Shortly after the festival his fledgling business got a big boost with a small write-up. Kim what, what to you what was the game changer? What what put this place over the top? Wow his presence and his dedication your chicken and hot sauce. Now Loyal customers are visiting this hot spot daily, decked out with the colors and vibes of Jamaica. From curried chicken and goat to jerk everything, food fans walk away feeling the island love. In 2018, Tony laid down more permanent roots in Texas. You opened up a brick and mortar restaurant. Were you nervous about that? A little bit. It was well, a little bit. Let me hear. Kim, were you nervous? Oh, about yeah. That? I'm so glad you asked me that question. Yes, I was. It was something totally different and from a food truck going into a brick and mortar. I didn't come from the restaurant industry. I came from the finance side. Coming in, I was like, I was telling Tony, I said, I got this. You know, I can run this, no problem. But oh, no, 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 no. I was ringing the, the red light bell like, hey, I need some help. It was challenging, but also it was fun. Kim now helping run the business for both locations. Family always mean a lot to restaurant. You know, sometimes she, she would say, you never know, one day it might be just me and you, you gotta That's show right. me how to cut this meat. Uvalde, Texas, a small town that has become yet another landmark. How long do you think it took for all this damage to occur? Can you tell us what, what it was like? With our NBC News exclusive, Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts.
To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Right here. Jerk chicken and axe stand. Thank you Enjoy. very much, sir. Have a great day. You too. God bless. Tony Scott dishes out hundreds of plates to hungry customers each day, but he's best known for one Caribbean specialty. My mother is Jamaican, and in our house, oxtail was king. Yes. yes. Oxtail stew, oxtail and dumpling. Yeah. Oxtail, oh, wow. oxtail, oxtail. My mom is Southern, and she actually mentioned it to me. I said, oxtail, and she just said it was a beef. So I've never really had it. And then when you first had it? It was delicious. And I eat it all the time now. That's the problem. <laughs> Isn't it interesting that it was the cheapest cut of meat? Now it's considered wow. a delicacy. You go to all these oh. upscale restaurants, oxtail uh, ravioli, oh. oxtail rice, all the, it's now everybody's into oxtail. I know. No, I'm scared to go in a restaurant and not oxtail. <laughs> Does it? The price is so high. Bring on the oxtail stew! <laughs> Tony frequently sells out of the succulent oxtail, and it was finally time to see and taste why. Welcome to the chop, Mr. Hall. Oh, yeah. Oh, it smells good. It smells like Jamaica. Oh, hey, hey. This is the oxtail, oh. the famous oxtail that everybody go crazy over. Mm -hmm. And these are like the Jamaican product seasoning that we use. This have a good flavor to mm. it. Oh, wow. Tony's oxtails are seasoned with a spice mix that includes garlic powder, dried onion, paprika, black pepper, sugar, salt, and a few chef secrets. This is my product that I make. It's have like onion, it, it, um, bell pepper, um, scotch bonnet pepper, I also have a little bit of garlic in there. So this is like your own concoction? Yes. And then this is another Jamaican product they call Yava Blue Mountain Coffee. Uh, yeah. They say it's the best coffee in the world. Well, right. this is the Blue Mountain product of burn sugar. Oh, wow. And this is what we pour on it last, give it that, that good color. Then we just mix this up, make sure you rub it in properly. You want everything to rub into it. Normally, if you take a smell of it, even right now, oh yeah, you see, you, you, you can smell that flavor in it, and it doesn't cook. It smells, it. smells good. Right. He then lets the oxtails marinate overnight. Then they're added to a pot with water and slow cooked for several hours. This, what it comes out to be. Oh, now we're talking. For you to taste. Well, I came to Austin. The result, truly out of this world. You see how it fall off the bone? Mm. Oh, yeah. You know, we, we make sure we cook real tender because dental is very expensive. Mm -hmm. And you know, you go to some place, you have eating that meat and you have to be here to get it off the bone. You don't do that when you come here. Good thing Tony feels like talking. I'm too busy eating. And it doesn't stop with the oxtails. How is it, Mr. Hall? That's fantastic. This is curry goat right here. Taste that. <laughs> this is the jerk pork. Oh, jerk pork. I've never had jerk pork before. Oh. And that's also oh, wow. my homemade jerk sauce that I made. <laughs> okay, this is the famous curry chicken. And this is the carrot. Oh, so at least I can say I had my vegetables today. Yes. Look at how tender that chicken is. Tony also serves traditional peas and rice, which brought on a wave of nostalgia. This is black bean. When you open that pot, I thought, wait a minute. Yeah. This is my mother's peas and rice. This is great. 
And just when I thought I'd had enough? Wait a minute, I, I, I noticed these are beef patty. I gotta try that. Oh, that's a great crust. As a reminder of how far Tony's love for cooking has taken him. If you look up here, you see these little pats? Uh -huh. This pat right here is when I just started out. This is what I usually cook rice into. Wow. The reason why I keep this uh -huh. pat to show people is where Tony's Jamaican food is coming from. Mm -hmm. So what would you tell people who are thinking they've got a dream, they want to start something like you did? What would you tell them? First, you have to motivate yourself to do it. And never give up on your dream. My mama always tell me, don't make nobody tell you you can't do nothing. Tony, thank you so much. It's this a pleasure, Harley. It, it, it is it's, nice meeting you. It feels like I'm back in Jamaica. I'm glad you have that feeling. Everything but, gonna be all right. Welcome back to you today. We've got a lot to celebrate yes. on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody's good, and that's it! Yeah. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Ali Jackson now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. The midterms are here. It's time to plan your vote. We'll provide everything you need to know to successfully cast your ballot. Just select any state you want to learn about for the primary or general election, and you'll instantly get voting rules, see the next big deadline, and learn how to take action for your plan. Voting rules have changed since 2020, and those rules vary from state to state. So it's time to get planning for 2022. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now? What it all means for you for an hour every day? It can be hard to keep up. So let's get started together. Hallie Jackson now weekdays at five on NBC News Now. Hallie Jackson now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Just a few miles from the hustle and bustle of downtown Austin is Mekong Bistro. It is a spot that's loved by locals and tourists alike for its Vietnamese comfort food. Who's the better cook uh, in the family? Um, I'm not going to even bother asking my mom about that because my mom is hands down the best cook. <laughs> Chef Will Hyun and his siblings opened Mekon Bistro to honor their mother, Anne Hang. A refugee who fled Vietnam after the fall of Saigon, Anne working tirelessly to provide for her family in the United States. She took a chance to travel across the ocean with nothing in hand working ever since she's been over here, working from morning to night uh, and still provide us with a hot meal every day. When Macon first opened, Will hoped that his mom would finally stop working, but Anne had other plans. Technically, she's retired, but like I said, she, she would not stay home. Anne's passion for food starting in her home country. In 1972, Anne married Kia Huynh. They had four children in Vietnam. Anne turning to cooking to help support the family. This is my dad and my mom right, right before the fall of Saigon. When the Vietnam War ended, the family was looking toward a better future in their homeland. 
But in 1975, the Viet Cong began to invade Saigon. Giải phóng vô thì mẹ muốn đi muốn tự do, không có muốn ở bên Việt Nam nữa muốn đi tìm tự do. Anne's husband fled the city first, well leaving when he was just seven years old. It was scary. We left separately, uh, me with my uncle and my mom with my three sisters that came a year later uh, because if you get caught, you were thrown in jail. Luckily, we made it out. We were rescued by uh, cargo boats, but uh, they rescued us. They took us to the Malaysian refugee camp. Will and his uncle secured refugee status, eventually reuniting with Will's dad in the U.S. In the years spent apart from his mother, Will began experimenting in the kitchen with a little nudge from his uncle. He told me that, you know, there's only two of us. You're going to have to do, you know, do your share. So learn to cook something. <laughs> in 1983, Anne made the journey to the U.S. with her daughters. Đi vượt biên thì nó đi tàu nhỏ thì nó cũng hơi khó khăn. Nhưng mà qua được tới ấy rồi toàn tụ gia đình thì rất mừng. Tại vì chồng con gặp đợi mặt chồng con hết. Thành ra rất là sung sướng. But adjusting to a new country as refugees was a struggle. When we came over, you know, nothing in our pockets. We, we relied on government assistance a little bit. Luckily, she's a great cook. Uh, so it, it wasn't bad for us at all. But growing up, that's how she you know, shows us that she loved us by you know, putting all that love into the food. The family moving from Houston to Louisiana, finding work in the seafood industry. But Will wasn't so happy living in a small town. When his uncle invited him to attend high school in Austin, Will said yes right away. I fell in love with Austin. The beautiful lakes, the miles of trails, the music scene. What's there not to love? <laughs> Austin's vibrant culinary scene struck a chord. After high school, Will found work in several restaurants, dreaming of being able to showcase his mom's cooking. In 2015, the entire family moving to Austin. But Anne still wasn't sure about opening a restaurant. Asked her many, many times in the past to do something like that. She's dead set against it. She said, it's just way too much work. Eventually, Anne agreed to share her recipes for just one reason, her family. Thích làm với con cái mới mới lên hái hép với con cho con. Chứ giờ lớn tuổi rồi thì cũng còn sống được bao lâu nữa. Thì lại giờ cho cho con được ngày nào thì hay ngày nấy thì hấp cho con mình ngày nào thì hay ngày nấy thôi. She's, she's emotional because like, you know, she basically you know, she's doing everything for her kids. The first dish Will added to the menu, his mom's pho. So pho, you know, at a restaurant is basically how we do pho at home. Uh, when we cook pho at home, it's a big pot that's going to feed us for at least three days. Um, we have pho for breakfast, we have pho for lunch, we have pho for midtime snack, we have pho for dinner and follow at night for snack at night uh, until the pot's gone. With the help of his family, Will created several new dishes. Our menu does incorporate a lot of uh, fusion Asian dishes um, and that is because of the you know the family business. Uh, my, my mom's a cook, I cook, my sister cooks, my brother cooks. Uh, second beef dish was something that I've tried out. I consider myself a Texan. We love beef. It's a dish that my mom and I collaborated together to, to put out. Basically, this tubes of real nice tender beef that's been flashed in a wok. It's been six years since Macon Bistro opened, and Will and his mom still love working together. Làm ăn gia đình thì cái này cũng như giúp cho con thôi. Thầy thấy nó nó tự xúc động rồi mình nấy thôi chứ mẹ đâu có biết làm sao giờ. Mình thấy nó hy sinh cho con mình được thì ngày nào thì hãy nấy vậy thôi. Mình thấy nó xúc động vậy thôi. I admire her great. The courage it takes just to make that journey and to just stick with us no matter thick and thin. She's my hero. She really is my hero. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now.
Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Uvalde, Texas, a small town that has become yet another landmark. How long do you think it took for all this damage to occur? Can you tell us what, what it was like? With our NBC News exclusive. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Using food to bring younger generations closer to their heritage happens in families all across America. And it's happening here at Habesha with a husband and wife team who's using their restaurant to bring their daughters closer to their Ethiopian roots. We want more than anything else people to be familiar with not just Ethiopian food, but Ethiopian culture. My name is Yine Fantu. This is my wife, Salama Bebe. We ran an Ethiopian restaurant called Habesha in Austin. When it opened in 2013, Habesha was the second Ethiopian restaurant in Austin. People stay coming in here. We give them the food. They said, where is the fork? Your hands. <laughs> Ethiopian food is eaten with injera, a fermented flatbread made with teff, a gluten-free grain. You'll see a family dining, and everyone is on their phone eating and really not enjoying the, the, the event. Not you cannot here. do that in Ethiopian restaurants. You have to use your hands. You can't. Both of them. That emphasis on family is everywhere in Habesha, from the Ethiopian art and decor to Yidni and Salam's daughters, who can often be found studying at the restaurant. I think I was like around four years old when we opened, so like this is like my second home. Salam and Yidni were born and raised in different parts of Ethiopia. In the 90s, they left Africa to attend college here in the United States. Yidni immigrating to Texas, Salam to Maryland, where her family owned an Ethiopian restaurant. A chance meeting bringing them together. My dad was visiting a friend, dining at uh, her family restaurant, and she happened to be the waitress. And uh, he overheard a music playing and uh, asked her, hey, uh, where could I get the CD? And she was nice enough to, to grab the CD and hand it to him. But Yidney's dad was thinking about more than music. When he got home, he immediately gave his son a call. And he said, hey, just uh, call her and thank her for me. <laughs> <laughs> when he called me, I was like, I give it to your dad, not for you. <laughs> and then he kept calling me. I was like, OK, I think he's not going to give up. My dad was uh, one who hooked me up. <laughs> <laughs> they dated long distance before Salam moved to Texas, the couple marrying in 2003. Their daughters, Edel and Azel, are now teenagers. I think we've always been around food. My mom's always cooking. For me, I love her pancakes. She makes <laughs> the best pancakes. Salam left the restaurant industry to focus on parenting, but Yidney knew his wife's heart was in cooking professionally. What I saw in her was the passion to own her own business. I really want to open a restaurant, and I love the customer service and cooking. In 2012, Yidney and Salam finding the perfect location for their restaurant. Austin is a, a, a very unique town in that there is people from all walks of life. And I think part of the reason that we are successful is because of that diversity. Habesha's menu honors their Ethiopian heritage with many vegetarian dishes, from stewed yellow split peas to braised collard greens. They also serve more than a dozen dishes with beef. Texas is, uh, has a lot of people that loves meat, so we have a bigger selection of 
meat as well. And I think my favorite dish in that is the kutfo or the steak tartare when it's uh, done right. That's probably the best dish in the world. It's a ground beef and mixed with butter and spices. When the pandemic hit, Habish's popularity helped save them from closure. And I said, okay, this is it. I, I think we're gonna fall down now. And then people, they support us. They love to be here. They send us check. They send us cards. We have a good, good community. The donations from fans kept them afloat until they figured out a to-go plan. Before COVID, takeout business was only three or four percent of our business. And overnight, we had to do a hundred percent of our business. And by nature, Ethiopian food is not take out, so we have to figure out a way to package the food, to market the food. After laying off most employees, the couple had to work nonstop. As the to-go business began ramping up, Edel and Azel pitched in to support their parents and save their beloved second home. I would write down like the orders, like the online orders, and I would like put them in the kitchen and cleaning, washing the dishes, cutting the injera, like folding it boxing up to the orders. They did a lot and they're part of the reason why we're still around. So I'm sorry I get a little emotional when I talk about them, but uh, yeah, they're, uh, they're incredible. They're uh, just a uh, love of my life. One of the things that we instill in them is knowing who they are, uh, where their parents came from, and learning the culture learning the food. Salam is looking forward to a busier future at her dream restaurant. I want to uh, grow this business and a lot of people, they never had Ethiopian food. They had Chinese food, Italian food, or Indian food. So they don't know about Ethiopian food. I'm really proud of her because like she she gets frustrated at times, but she doesn't let that like stop her. A really big inspiration to me. Whenever things get hard, you just keep going. The best part working with your partner is the fact that you're there for each other. To comfort each other when it's down and uh, to be there when your partner needs you. The best part of it, he knows what I can't do, he covered. The same thing, he cannot cook. <laughs> so, okay, she can handle it. With Austin's welcoming atmosphere, it's no surprise that more chefs are putting down roots in this fast-growing city. It's everything from James Beard, award-winning chefs, and taqueros, and even home cooks. The thing that makes a food scene good is different cultures meeting each other and being able to influence each other. The fact that anything is possible is what makes Austin such a cool place. One thing that rings true here in Austin, no matter your background or culture, there's room for everyone at the table. Welcome to Wellness Today. I'm Chanel Jones. We've made it to July and summer is here in full swing. This year I've been trying to live what I call self-care summer. Making time for daily quick walks, maybe my annual checkups, all so I can be the best version of myself. Summer is also the perfect time to tap into play and have a little fun. It's also the season to eat more fruits and vegetables. And why not take a staycation while trying outdoor activities like kayaking? So join me as we make our own well-being a priority and celebrate self-care summer. While many of us think of self-care as a time spent resting and relaxing, it's also important to experience all the fun that life can offer. But how can play impact our health for the better? Take a look. From kicking a soccer ball to playing a game on your phone, 
fun is a feeling that many crave. Play really is a basic human need. For Dr. Edward Laskowski, play has been at the center of much of his work. We all need a release from the stress that we're under. We need our minds to to be free, to be innovative, and to be creative. Play traces its roots to humans' closest friends. It's interesting, in the animal kingdom, we see play commonly exhibited in the ape family, how the young ones are, in essence, almost taught through play different maneuvers. I think in, in humans, oftentimes, we think of play as reserved only for kids but those unique advantages of play also extend to adults. Play can come in a number of forms. There are three types of play. There's social play, where we play with each other, and this could be playing games, but it may be also exercising with friends and, and doing stuff together. There's also benefits of independent play, which means we may do something by ourselves. We may love to do a, a Sudoku or a puzzle or a Wordle today. And guided play is, is something that maybe we'll be instructed in a, in a new a new activity. Maybe we'll get cooking together and we'll, um, make pasta or something like that. The impact of play, tangible and meaningful at any age. It actually changes, it produces muscle relaxation. It can increase blood flow when it's combined with movement. Those are all good physical things that it does. And psychologically, it does a, a huge benefit as far as reducing stress, reducing anxiety, modifying the effects of depression and those who have frequent play incorporated into their lifestyle. Proving that taking time for fun can be of immense value. When we step back, when we're given a chance to let our minds run free and play and figure out things in a different way than a job way, that all helps our, our whole state of being. Now that we've seen the science behind why play is important, let's break down how we can have a little fun. We're excited to welcome someone who knows how to have a good time. Annie F. Downs is an author, speaker, and podcast host who is the founder of the That Sounds Fun Network, where she celebrates the idea of fun and helps people find it themselves every single day. Welcome to you, Annie. Oh, hi, Chanel. Happy self-care summer. Happy self-care summer. It's funny because I made it up literally in the doctor's office and it's become a thing. Um, all right, so this sounds even silly to ask, <laughs> but what does it mean, uh, you know, when we talk about having fun and play? It isn't silly to ask because kids get it, but adults have forgotten, right? Like we just don't mm. prioritize play and fun anymore, but we feel it in our bodies. I mean, it is part of self-care. What's true about you and I both, Chanel, is we put everything in our lives and make time for what makes us healthy, and fun is part of that. I believe it. So if you're not feeling your best, I mean, everybody knows how to have fun if you're in a good mood and you're going to a party. Talk about some things that we can do, um, you know, to, to find it. Yeah, I mean, it's the it's the challenge of holding both the joy and suffering of life and telling yourself the truth. If things are hard, that is okay. But can you also find a little fun in your day? You can do it alone. There's a lot of ways that you can have fun with what matters most to you, with your partner, with your friends, with kids in your life, with your community. I mean, there is fun really everywhere. As long as you don't think fun has to be big and expensive. If you can remember fun can be small and quiet, Sometimes, not all the time, I'm not very often quiet, mm. but it can be short, and it can be inexpensive. It's it is really available to you to help you feel healthy. I know, you know, I was just reading that, you know, it's important to be able to have fun by yourself. Can you give me some ideas about that? It can end up feeling a little selfish to some people, but the reality is it makes you who you want to be. And if we work so hard, I love this quote. Someone says, if we work so hard with our minds, we need to rest and have fun with our hands. And if we work every day mm. with our hands, we need to be resting with our minds. So because I write books and I'm like you, I talk all day long. One of my favorite hobbies, I brought it to show you, Cheryl. I cross stitch. I did the entire mm. sky. I'm very proud of myself. <laughs> but I it love just gives that. Thing to do. And thank you. I'm very proud. <laughs> it gives your hands something to do. So it can be gardening or cooking or playing a sport or working outside, just, just running around, doing things like cross stitch or knitting, things that are small and in your home you can do by yourself. It'll just bring you joy and get you off your phone. Scrolling is not a hobby. Chanel, we know that, right? Scrolling's Ooh, not a hobby. That's a t-shirt. Scrolling is not a hobby. Right? Let's talk about having fun with a partner when we get that special one-on-one -on -one time together. What do you recommend? Yeah, I have often found for myself and for my friends that when you are with your partner, if you will just ask them, 
what sounds fun to you? I know that sounds really simple, Chanel, but if you say what sounds fun to you and then you ask them why three times, hmm. by the time you get that third why, they're actually telling you something about self-care and about their heart and about their childhood. And so you can kind of say, man, I didn't know that was important to you when you were little, or I didn't know that mattered so much to you. You said you wanted to play basketball, but what I'm hearing you say is that was a hobby you and your dad did together and you really miss your dad. In every city we live in, there's things we haven't explored, right? So keep it local, keep it interesting. Look online and look and see what restaurants everybody else is eating at that you haven't tried yet. And kind of being an adventurer in your own life is so fun. It's like marriage therapy through fun. Uh, let's talk about friendships. I, even for me, especially, you know, a lot of us have younger ones. And so we're so busy by the time we do work and try to connect with our spouses and try to connect with our children. Our friends sometimes fall by the wayside. So what's your advice for how to stay in touch and build in fun uh, with your friends? This is going to sound way too easy, but the reality is you just put it on your calendar. And then the fun thing is what ends up happening when you put it on your calendar and you get in a group text, all of a sudden you're going, what are we going to do? Well, what sounds fun to you? Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden this actual deep conversation happens among friends and you go, I, I didn't know that mattered to you. Yes, we will do that. And by the time that thing on the calendar gets here, you know your people better and you're getting to have fun together. And I think you're right. I've even noticed with my friendships, just through planning something far off, it's just the day-to-day -day thread sometimes where you can stay connected, you know? Yes, and it just makes you feel um, more like you. It does for me, at least. Like, And that's what we're doing. If we're looking at fun as part of self-care, we're going, how can I be more like me and a healthier version of me after this summer? And one of the ways is more connection and fun breeds connection. I love it. All right, so finally, let's talk about ideas for your kids and how they can have fun. Sometimes it can feel like another job, but you've got three things here. You've got a soccer ball, a Frisbee, and I'm not sure what this is. It's a towel? It's a blanket. A blanket? Yeah. Oh, it's a picnic. It looks like a picnic blanket. Yes, that's exactly right. I'm telling you, those are the three things I keep in my car all the time. I brought it here with me. I keep those in my trunk all the time because anytime I'm with kids, I'm not married yet, don't have kids yet, but they are all over my life. And if I'm with kids and suddenly they can throw a Frisbee, I want to be ready. And so when it comes to kids, you know if you, what? That's if you so good, them, so fun. If you will let them lead, if you will, if you ask them what sounds fun to you and they say, I would love to go jump in a creek and you go, all right, we'll figure it out. It may be messy, but if you will let them lead, kids are going to take you to fun almost every time. I love it. Sometimes adults, we just need to let go a little bit. Good advice. Right. Thank you, Annie. Annie's book, Chase the Fun, 100 Days to Discover Fun Right Where You Are, uh, released August the 2nd. Thank you, Annie. It was nice to talk to you today. Uh, you too. Go out All and have right. some fun while you mm -hmm. have self-care. Cheers to that. All right, coming up, a nutritionist shares tips to eat more fruits and vegetables, and later, a quick upper body workout that will help you find your confidence this season. All that and more just ahead on Wellness Today. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. The midterms are here. It's time to plan your vote. We'll provide everything you need to know to successfully cast your ballot. Just select any state you want to learn about for the primary or general election, and you'll instantly get voting rules, see the next big deadline, and learn how to take action for your plan. Voting rules have changed since 2020, and those rules vary from state to state. So it's time to get planning for 2022. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. 
Welcome back. The most recent American Dietary Guidelines suggest that healthy eating includes consuming a variety of fruits and vegetables, as we all know. So with summer in full swing, a lot of popular produce is in peak season across the country. So if you're hoping to take advantage of this and increase your fruit and vegetable intake, we have registered dietitian Vanessa Rosetto. She is here with some tips and some yummy recipes to make it easier, something you can try today when you get home or if you are at home. Hello. Hi, nice to see you. So I think most people know we should be eating fruits and vegetables, yada, yada, yada. But yep. can you give us really quickly just a real, I guess, a better understanding of the benefits, what we underestimate? Yeah, you know, fruits and vegetables have antioxidants, they have vitamins, they have minerals, they help with your gut health. You know, there's a lot of fiber in fruits and vegetables, so that helps to keep you full. So if you're looking for a lot of bang for your buck when you're eating a meal, you always want to pair it with a fruit or a vegetable. Right. I think people think it's all or nothing. Like, I have to eat only plants in order for me to be healthy, and that's not entirely true. It's just like, let's look for ways to incorporate it at most meals. So it's really easy to get them in at breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and you don't have to roast, you know, broccoli and, you know, turn your oven on. You right. can just, like, simply slice up carrots like I do with my kids. And so they're not going to eat roasted, you know, slaw or anything like that, but they'll grab the carrots and put it on the side of their protein, and that, that's the vegetable that they're eating for the day. All right, so with that said, let's dig in. The beautiful part to me about this season, you get to try fruits and vegetables or things that are in season that maybe you normally wouldn't try. Yep. Um, so what should we start with? This looks yummy. Yes, it's grilled romaine. Grilled romaine. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I work with uh, some really great people who've taught me this trick, which is take the romaine, put it on the grill. The whole thing? The whole thing, okay. a little bit of olive oil, salt, pepper, lemon juice, and it's just a fun way right. to eat lettuce. Like, the lettuce doesn't have to be dry. You don't have to put rice wine vinegar on it, and that's it. You're not relegated to misery just because you're eating a green. There's nothing else in there that's really good. No, there's nothing else in there. Parmesan cheese. Shaved Parmesan oh. will take things to another so place. So wait, take the grill. Wait, what's on there again? That's so when you're grilling the romaine, it's just mm. olive oil. Finish it off with some lemon juice. Mm. Then when you're making your meal, right, here's some rice. I got some chickpeas for some, for some extra protein okay. and then some shaved Parmesan on top. Mm. It just like gives a different flavor profile and it makes you want to eat it. Mm. It's not dull and, and dry. You know, it's a healthier choice, but it's legitimately yummy. Yeah. So you don't feel like you're depriving yourself. Exactly. That's good. All right, so next, what's this next one? You want to do this one? The frittata. Yeah, okay. so the frittata is the go-to on a Friday because the kids are always, like, at the pool, at camp. They're eating pizza and all these things, so it's not like they're not enjoying their summer. Sure. Sure. Um, but, you know, you, you go out and you buy these vegetables because they're in season, mm -hmm. and you're like, oh, I'm going to try something new, and then the week goes by and you didn't use it. It's true. So it's really easy to just crack 12 eggs, put that in a bowl, whisk it up, mm -hmm. get whatever the spinach or the broccoli that might be turning and isn't going to be good the next day and just bake it in the oven really quick and then I'll chop up any kind of, you know, mm. onion and um, broccoli and maybe some zoodles and bell peppers and a little bit of balsamic vinegar and we have dinner that night and we probably have breakfast the next you can morning. can save it. Yeah. It goes well in the fridge. Yeah. Wasted so many vegetables. Yeah. They just forget that they're there. Yeah, you yeah. and everybody else. and like, Or they just don't know what to do with them, That's right? True. So a lot of times I tell people, don't be afraid to buy frozen vegetables or frozen fruit. It really minimizes waste. They're allowed to ripen to the peak, and then it's minimal processing, flash frozen. So then you just take what you need when you need it. You can, you know, store it for the next time, yeah. and it doesn't go bad right away. This is good. All right, so this one, we should put the recipe on the website. What is this? So this is just a bunch of vegetables that, you know, are always turning in my refrigerator. Absolutely. Because, you know, it's like, oh, I'm going to buy these six yep. red bell peppers, and then I'm going to make my husband go down mm. and grill them, and then that never happened. Mm, <laughs> what's right? in there? Yeah, so it is um, red onions, because red mm. onions takes everything to another place that I love so much. Different types of peppers, right? Some zucchini, you know, you shave them really thin, okay. some balsamic vinegar, a little olive oil, done. It doesn't, is there like goat cheese or something? The goat cheese is on the... Um, oh, that's why. I was like, mm, <laughs> what is this? Because it, it all works together. together. But it all works together. But that's the thing. You don't have to make it complicated. You have these things already in your house. So just chop and serve. Vanessa, that's really good. Good. Okay, last but not least, a lot of us like to throw kebabs on the grill. Yeah, so what, so what I will do is, because I love pineapple, I'm still thinking about the pineapple that I had in Maui in 2006 on my honeymoon. <laughs> um, and so I will get a pineapple, mm -hmm. chop it up, I'll make the, the kebabs, Grilling pineapple brings out like a different kind of sweetness. And also the same when you're doing red onion or eggplant or tomatoes, it brings the sweetness to it that's really fun. And so you'll have that and maybe you're gonna have it as an appetizer and I'll put out nuts, my favorite pistachios mm. that are salt and vinegar pistachios, <laughs> try them, they're delicious. It gives a different flavor profile 
while. Sometimes I will, you know, grill up some chicken and then maybe tomorrow I'm going to use these kebabs with my chicken and make a different kind of chicken salad. Mm -hmm. And then I don't need to have, you know, extra lettuce. So there's just always some quick ways for you to have really fun and different foods that are plant forward yeah. that don't take a ton of time for you to make. Honestly, this is a good segment just because we know we're supposed to eat fruits yes. and vegetables, but we get in a rut yeah. when it comes to figuring out what to do with yeah. them. And like you said, we don't want to be in the kitchen all day. Yeah. So look at this table, everybody. These are all things that we can do. Thank you so much, Vanessa. Thanks for having me. These are really yummy. By the way, there are so many easy recipes that make fruits and vegetables the star of any meal. So I'm glad we did this. Just go to today.com slash food for breakfast, lunch, dinner. We have inspiration there. Thank you, Vanessa. Thank you so much. All right, coming up, hitting the pool or beach, use dumbbells and resistance bands to strengthen your arms for a better swim. And later, take a trip down the Hudson River in a kayak. That's right after this. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. Welcome back to you today. we got a lot to celebrate yes. on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody's good, and that's it! <laughs> Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now. Streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Well, meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Hey, who's this? Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back. As temperatures heat up, we're showing off our arms and tank tops and sleeveless dresses. Fitness expert Stephanie Mansour is going to demonstrate easy exercises that will tone our upper body and inspire some confidence throughout the rest of the summer. Hey everyone, I'm your trainer Stephanie Mansour and right now we're all enjoying the best parts of summer. Plus all of the outdoor activities like swimming, biking and kayaking. So today I'm gonna take you through a few easy exercises that you can do to strengthen and tone the upper body and the arms so that you feel good and strong in your summer tank tops and your sleeveless dresses. You can use dumbbells or resistance bands for these moves. I'm gonna show you how to use them both. Let's start with bicep curls. Now we're gonna pick up the dumbbells here and I have three pound weights, but you can start as low as one pound or you can go up as high as seven or eight pounds. So starting with your feet as wide as your shoulders, pull your abs in, softly bend your knees. We're gonna externally rotate the arms and move into a bicep curl with external rotation. We keep the elbows hugged in towards the side of your body so that we maintain proper form without getting out of alignment. We do 10 of those with the dumbbells. As an alternative, we can do 10 with the resistance bands. So standing on the resistance band with your feet as wide as your shoulders, externally rotating the shoulders here in the arms, holding those handles, exhale, curl up towards the shoulders and lower. Now what's great about these resistance bands is you'll feel resistance on the way up and on the way down of every single movement. Now next I'm going to show you an overhead press and this is a great move to work those shoulders and help make them look nice and sleek. We're going to start with the weights as high as your ears here in a goal post position. Pull your abs in, exhale, press the weights up over the head and come back to center. 
So you wanna make sure that you can look forward and see these weights in your peripheral vision. Now, you might be asking, okay, that's great, but how can I do that exercise with resistance bands? Let me show you how. What we're gonna do is instead of stepping on the resistance band with both feet, we're gonna step with one foot forward, one foot back in a staggered position. Pull the abs in, bend the front knee slightly, hold on to the resistance band handles at your ears. This is ear level in that goal post position. Exhale to press up and inhale lower. For the tricep kickback, we're gonna lean forward, abs in tight, and hug the elbows up towards the sides. As you have the elbows bent, you're gonna exhale and extend the arms back and then come to center. Make sure the upper arms are not moving. The upper arms are nice and stationary here as you're reaching the dumbbells back as if you're trying to punch the wall behind you with the tip of the dumbbell. Now I'm gonna show you from the other side too, leaning forward, hugging those elbows in, this is our starting position. We exhale, press back, inhale to center. Now we're gonna do the same motion with the resistance band, but instead of making you go get a new set of resistance bands, use the one with your handles, but have the handles hanging here with your hand underneath the resistance band, holding onto it at your chest. Use the other hand here with tension on the band, and then exhale to straighten the arm down, inhale to bend it. Exhale, straighten it down, Inhale to bend. The next exercise, a lateral raise. So again, we're going back to those shoulders. So pick up those dumbbells for the dumbbell version of the lateral raise. Stand with the feet as wide as the hips, abs in, knees softly bent. We're gonna exhale to bring the weights up as high as the shoulders, great. And then inhale, lower down. We can also do this with the resistance band. So what we're gonna do is grab the resistance band, step on it with both feet, and then we're gonna open the arms out to the sides as high as the shoulders and lower down. And notice, we've got that tension again on the upward motion and on the downward motion. All right, the last exercise in this upper body workout is V for victory. So we all wanna feel victorious this summer and every day. So we're gonna start with the feet as wide as the hips, hold those dumbbells down at your hips. From here, we're gonna lift the weights up into a V as high as the shoulders and lower down, good. So I've got my palms facing each other on this because it's more comfortable to hold onto the dumbbells this way. And I don't want you to have to use your forearms or any other muscles to do this, aside from the upper arms and the shoulders. Now we're gonna lift up the resistance band to do this and watch as I hold onto this resistance band with a different grip. So standing on the resistance band with your feet as wide as your hips, hold the bands down at your hips and then with the palms face down, we're gonna lift up to that V and lower down. Good, lift up to the V, relax the traps, lower down. So we do 10 reps of each of these. We repeat the entire series for three times total. And I promise you, if you do this routine every other day for a couple of weeks, you are gonna notice a major transformation in your arms and you're gonna feel so strong. Thank you, Stephanie. You can do each of these exercises for 10 reps and do three rounds for a complete upper body workout. And it's never too late to get moving. In fact, join the Start Today community on Facebook to find others just like you who are getting stronger each day. Coming up, Donna shows off an easy staycation exercise that's perfect for the whole family just ahead. Stay with us. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. The midterms are here. It's time to plan your vote. We'll provide everything you need to know to successfully cast your ballot. Just select any state you want to learn about for the primary or general election, and you'll instantly get voting rules, see the next big deadline, and learn how to take action for your plan. Voting rules have changed since 2020, and those rules vary from state to state. So it's time to get planning for 2022. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today. It's a can't miss summer on today. Ah! They are walking strong, elegant, and pretty easy to prepare. How to cut costs on your vacation. Vicki has the answers. Every single thing you need for the best summer yet. Only on today. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. 
For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to Wellness Today. The best part of summer is the adventures, and oftentimes there is one right in your own backyard. We are joining today contributor Donna Farazan as she goes on a relaxing kayaking journey down the Hudson River. I kind of immediately feel like I'm on vacation. Yeah, exactly. You feel like you're in the Caribbean and you're only 20 minutes outside of New York City. There's more to do in Sleepy Hollow than hunt for the headless horseman. Wow, this is gorgeous. Look at this. Can I dip my toe in? Absolutely, absolutely. Feel this the water temperature. This is the first beach of the season, Mike. Oh, a little chilly, but refreshing. Why should kayaking be on everyone's list this summer? It's the memories. You know, the memories that you get to experience it with family, friends. It's a team building activity. My guide, Mike Napoleon, has led kayak tours with Hudson River Recreation for the past four seasons. I always kind of introduce people to paddling sports as a lazy man sport. You want to do minimal effort to get as far as you want to go and then get to your destination and enjoy it. The water conditions are, are everything. You always kind of want to know your scenarios and know what you're getting into before you go. After I got my life jacket on securely, Mike showed me a few paddling basics before we hit the water. So if I take the center of my paddle here, I throw it right over my head and I use that as my middle point. And I make two boxes here, one right here and then another one with this arm. I now know that my elbows are right at 90 degrees. So now I can take my paddle and I know the optimum placement for my hands. Okay. Big thing is it's a sweep stroke. And the reason I say that is because it's really easy to remember that you're almost trying to sweep the floor. And that's going to actually help me nice out and wide and actually help me to actually turn the boat. I feel ready for a total body workout. I hopped in the cockpit. All right, you all set? I already love it. I could just sit here. We have to paddle now? <laughs> well, that's part of the fun, but we don't have to go too far. It's all about enjoying the paddle. I feel like I'm the star of my own movie right now. There you go. Look at your cruising now. I'm going to have to catch up. Come catch up, Mike. <laughs> Full speed ahead. And anyone can give this sport a try. Kayaking's for everyone. I mean, all ability levels, all age groups. There's adaptive kayaking where there's special equipment that's involved. So it really has made the sport very inclusive and very adaptive too. Now, as we come around the bend here, we have a fantastic view of the Tappan Zee Lighthouse, a great view of the Tappan Zee Bridge. There's something about being on the water, being able to just reach out and touch it. It's cleansing. Oh, it feels really good. I will say the other great thing about this sport is that I really am only thinking about what I'm doing right exactly. now. Exactly, you're, you're in, in the, the moment. Present. The water is crystal. The water is pristine, beautiful, the perfect clear. temperature too. Couldn't ask for a better day. What's your favorite thing to do at the end of each kayaking session? I mean, obviously are, are some nice tacos and a cerveza. Tacos and a beer? Absolutely, that's the way to go. I had a great time and I think we have one more thing that we need to do. Do you? Yeah, I have a little something for you. Thank you for being such a gracious host. Now oh, it's time for my favorite part. <laughs> perfect. Thank you very much. Cheers. Cheers. Great to, paddling with you. Great paddling with you. To kayaking, to a the new views. zen that I need, and uh, to the views. Absolutely. Cheers. Thanks to Hudson River Recreation for guiding Donna's trip in Sleepy Hollow. Well, thank you for joining me to embrace the joy that I call self-care summer. I hope you feel inspired to have some fun, eat a little healthier, and move in ways that makes your body feel energized. And to use this summer to prioritize you. I'm Chanel Jones, and we'll see you next time on Wellness Today. So I, listen, without giving away too much, mm -hmm. and I know you won't, what, what, is, what is NOPE about? It's about a lot of things. Um, and, and I think, you know, the, the first notion that uh, I latched onto when I was writing this movie was this idea of, of making a spectacle, making something people would have to see. Right here, you are gonna witness an absolute 
spectacle. So what happens next? Are you ready? Mm-hmm. Are you ready? Here we go. And and I, I felt like I was uh I was fighting for cinema. I was fighting for the theater, theatrical experience when I was writing this film. So it's about spectacle. And from there, I, I, I explored that and started to sort of uncover what I think is like the dark side of our relationship with spectacle. You could make the argument, I watched it last night, you could make the argument that the film, at least on its face, seems to be about this idea that spectacle can consume us does consume us, quite literally, in, in some cases. Is, is that part of, of what we were going for? I mean, we are, <laughs> I like what you did. The, it, look, this is a society of the spectacle. And I think that uh, the, the, the idea of spectacle um, harms us in many ways, whether it's something we are so obsessed by that we, um, we give it too much power because it's, uh, it has a spect spectacular nature to it, or if it's because we use the spectacle to distract the, ourselves from the truth. We have this very, uh, very uh, dark relationship with it. And I, I, I think about bottlenecking, right? When we're, when we're driving, when we're in traffic and there's an accident, and that traffic slows down. Yeah. It's because everybody's sneaking a peek at that awful spectacle, and it's slowing everybody down. And so that, I latched onto that and said, let's make a movie about that. This would be an opportunity. I'm talking rich and famous for life. There's plenty of videos for flying online. You know what nobody gonna get what we gonna get. What we gonna get? The money shot. It's about human nature. Yeah. All my films are about human nature and about something that um, I fear is part of our DNA and, and scares me. And it's something that I share with us, but I, 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 I feel like it, it hasn't been sort of pinpointed yet. I, I read uh, in an interview recently that, that you, you maintain this is not a film that could have been made five years ago. Why not? Uh, I think there's, you know, a, a lot of reasons. You know, I think from, a, 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 from, from the standpoint of, uh, you know, representation, I think this idea of, you know, letting a black director um, put his vision into a, a film and commit to it, and, and into a, you know, a fly, the Great American Flying Saucer film. Um, you know, I, I let's just let's put it this way: five years ago, I didn't think they would ever let me do that. And so I, uh, and then even you know, on the on the technological front, yeah. you know, I worked with cinematographer Hoyt van Hoytema, um, who is absolute legend, and and some of the techniques we developed on this to achieve spectacle have never been attempted before and um and so I, i'm just very proud of what we pulled off in that way. a couple times i'm watching i'm i'm thinking this is expensive <laughs> this this is this is really expensive they gave jordan peele the checkbook and i'm like go do what you want hey you know <laughs> yeah i mean look they, I, I that that's an, another piece of this puzzle yeah. is that you know so much of my uh career before I became a director was, you know, marred with this, um, this uh, internalized sense that I could never be allowed to do that, that no one would ever trust me with, the, with money, uh, in, you know, enough money to do my, to do my vision, yeah. the way they would trust other people. I, just, I felt that that was true. And so here I am, Universal Studios, they, they've proven me wrong. Get out. The, the social commentary on, on, on race is, is obvious. Um, with this is the way we have to wait for the um, the tram to go by. Yes, yeah. these which are is, folks by the, who are going to be coming to see. This is monumental. This is what I'm about. This is what it's about right here. We that, right now, them over. they think that I am. Donald Peel. Yeah, Mr. Peel. It's his set. Welcome. Okay. Yeah. Welcome. They'll come back next week. They come, yeah, they'll think I'm, I'm an animatronic <laughs> that's just here, and they'll come back. So, get out, obviously. I mean, the social commentary there on, on, on race is it's pretty obvious. Do you find the being African-American has more advantage or disadvantage in the modern world? <laughs> oh. It's a tough one. 
<laughs> yeah, I'm, I don't know, man. And I think you can make the argument that that us is sort of about uh, what human beings, like what we're capable of, the mm -hmm. sinister nature of, of our behavior. This doesn't seem to be as much about race. Is that is that by design? Yeah, you know, it's certainly not as much about Get Out, where you know the very fabric of the plot. Um, um, machinations were about, you know, this racial dynamic. You know, I, I feel like it's impossible to make a mo movie with um, people of color in it and have it not be about race. I mean, hell, I think it's impossible to make a, a, any movie without it being about race because, you know, race is all around us. You know, I think what what is interesting and, and sort of where the, the notion of nope and the title came from, which on one hand is, you know, something that black people recognize as our point of view in horror situations is this acknowledgement that of this thing we're talking about, where this is this you can't have black people in a flying saucer film and just have it be the same experience. It's just it's not. There's a there's a different relationship. No, 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 no. And this film is also which is, takes place uh, in the outskirts of uh, Hollywood or the, um, you know, the the industry of the spectacle, um, you know, is also so wrapped up with this idea of um, uh, representation and erasure, which you know those themes those themes are in there, but to your point, um, it, it, it's an event. It, it, it's an adventure and a horror spectacle about, about human nature. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Uvalde, Texas, a small town that has become yet another landmark. How long do you think it took for all this damage to occur? Can you tell us what, what it was like? With our NBC News exclusive. It's a can't miss summer on today. Bam! They are walking strong, elegant, and pretty easy to prepare. How to cut costs on your vacation? Vicky has the answers. Every single thing you need for the best summer yet. Only on today. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Top story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at seven on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. I think, you know, as we talk about spectacles, you know, it becomes abundantly clear that all the, the themes and characters in this movie interact or represent the media in some way and, uh, or some faction of mm -hmm. it. And uh, obviously the nucleus of the media I'm sort of examining here is, is, is Hollywood mm -hmm. it, and uh, the selling of, of dreams, the selling of nightmares, the selling of illusion. Um, is, uh, is, is that, that's in the cornerstone of the piece. But it's not just an indictment of Hollywood. I mean, there, there, are, there are a couple moments in the film where it's sort of an indictment of, of, of us, yeah. of, of, of journalism. Yeah, yeah, any, 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 any time that we're going to make money yeah. off of the human need to see something crazy, mm -hmm. um, that to me is what, what I call spectacleization. God. And I'm a I'm I'm a guilty party. Yeah, you're a guilty party. Um, we pretty we we kind of all are yeah. in some ways, whether what whatever side we're all, all on it, and that's kind of the point. We are, by the way. Okay, here we go. This is a big deal. This is a because Jordan Peele yeah. has been memorialized. Memorialized? Is on that, the, oh, I mean, on does the that line, happen after you've got Jaws? You've got just, Back to the Future. Yeah, but you I'm don't still, have a lot of sets. I just. But I mean, well, that's true. That's, that's, that's a good point. But you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, I mean, this is a big yeah, deal. No, this is good. This is this is this, this is your set. Uh huh. So this, uh, if I can tell you about the the, I would the, love the space. Yeah. I know you saw the film, but uh, this is Jupiter's claim. 
um, which is a, a theme park uh, owned by a former child star, a Ricky Juke Park, played by Steven Yeun. Mm -hmm. um, it, it is in the vision of the movie a Kid Sheriff that he was in as a child in the mid-90s. I don't know if you remember that film, Kid Sheriff. I, I do not know. Okay, well, well it's real. Yeah. Um, and here we are. And, and obviously, um, you know, it, there, there's, there's more to meets the eye than here. So, you know, if you're going to, see, when you're going to see Nope. Yeah. So there, there is another layer um, <laughs> to, to what happens here. You don't want to give away too much. Don't want to give away too much. But, uh, but you could make the argument that this is a centerpiece of, of the film, the Star Lasso experience. We won't tell folks exactly. We won't tell people what happened what there. What happened here. But um, something did happen there. Something did occur. And uh, yeah, here we are. No, I mean, look, you know it's a, a UFO movie. Yeah. And um, yeah, there's, there is a, you know, something about this world that to, to juxtapose the sort of uncanny valley um, world of this, of this, um, th th this, um, this sort of mom and park theme park yeah. um, right in the middle of a uh, sort of UFO hotspot. Um, it was just the kind of juxtaposition that was, it was very me, I thought. If someone had said to you 10, 15, 20 years ago that Jordan Peele, one of his films would, would, would mm. have permanent space here on the lot at Universal, what would you have said? I would have said, well, then it would have worked. My plan would have worked. <laughs> this um, is part of the grand plan all along. I mean, yeah. Okay. You know, I don't, you know, I don't know if I knew to really dream this big, but I, but I did, I did. I mean, when I, you know, when I first came to Universal Studios as a kid, I, I was very enamored with um, the, I was just very enamored with movie making and, and the idea of being in a space where people actually make movies. Mm -hmm. And I, I just wanna, and, and so, you know, to have a home on, on a, a lot, let alone this lot, is just very special to me. It's a can't miss summer on today. Help! They are walking strong, elegant, and pretty easy to prepare. How to cut costs on your vacation? Vicky has the answers. Every single thing you need for the best summer yet. Only on today. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. This is a critical turn point for this fire. And good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. Texas, a small town that has become yet another landmark. How long do you think it took for all this damage to occur? Are you tell us what, what it was like? With our NBC News exclusive. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Michael Abels, uh, he, of course, scored this one. He scored Get Out. Uh, he's, he scored us. I interviewed him a few months ago. I've been a fan of his work for a long time. And he told the story of, of when you called to invite him on that first project. He thought you were punking him. Uh, what? what? What is it about Michael and his style that has led you guys to work together so much? Well, it's so funny that he thought I was punking him because I, you know, I really, I had never directed a film when I first reached out to him on Get Out. And what, what I loved about his style is he, he has an ability to 
create new genres of, of music. And he can do it many times. You can sort of describe a new flavor of music and he can achieve that. They took him. They took him all. I've gotta get out of this house. I'm trying to save you. My brother is out there. And uh, that's how I want my films to feel. I want it to feel like something you've never experienced. And so, <clears throat> you know, that, that's, that's what he does. He's like, he's like a, a, you know, he's like a Shaolin yeah. monk. You know? That's a great, I mean, and masterful. Just, yeah. I mean, the music last night, you know, not to give away too much, but I, I feel like when you watch and you listen to a Jordan Peele film now, you know and that it's a Jordan Peele film. Like that's become one of the uh, hallmarks of it. I love that. I it's love true. that. You know, it's, I spend a lot of time uh, just focusing on this responsibility of trying to be a, a mirror for what comes in, you know, and um, and so to to hear at the end people say that they they are, can see me in there in the cross section of these things they sort of see me. I, I feel like yeah, you, you do. Daniel Kaluuya, uh, you guys have become um, quite the dynamic duo. Um, mm -hmm. We came to know him and, and get out. We see him again here. Mm -hmm. um, what is it about working with Daniel that, that makes it so special? I, Daniel, I, you know, I've said it before, I'll say it again. He's my favorite actor um, to watch and, and to work with as well. He, he we have a, a, a special, I mean, I, I believe he has this with any director he has, has this with, but we have a, a, a shorthand that is just, it's just the dream as a director that you can have somebody and with very little words, it's like siblings, you know? Very little words, we can come up to each, I can, we walk up after a scene, I can be like, you know that thing, but, mm, what? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh. You know, it's like one of those silent conversations yeah. and um, he's just, he's so committed. You know, he's so, so focused, such a professional. Um, yeah, man, that's my, that's my uh, star. I want to talk about something. I, I want to ask you whether something informs your work and if so, how, how it does. You are a, a biracial man in America, white mom, black father. And, and some of the themes that we've seen emerge in your films, it would seem from the outside, it, it would seem to be that that, that worldview informs your movie making in a, in a somewhat pronounced way. Is, is that accurate? And if so, how? You know, I mean, my, my race, I think, has informed my entire artistic <laughs> Uh, journey, and and part of it has been trying to reconcile um, the box and the boxes that um, this the country um, puts people of color in, and trying to break out of that box, what, what those boxes, whatever, and trying to identify what does this mean, what you know, what what, and so I think from an early on, you know, you see this pattern in my work. It is about. Um, Digging into d digging into those boxes so I can shed them and break 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 out of them, and so you know ever you know ever since I kind of started on that mission, I got into this pattern of just like look if I see a box I'm gonna break it, if I see something I'm not supposed to do I'm gonna do it, <laughs> and I'm gonna figure out how to make it work. When people leave the theater after they see this this film, what do you want them to be thinking about? Not to think, but what do you want them to be thinking about? Mm. I mean, that's a great question. I, uh, you know, I mean, this is their turn. This is their time for their end of the conversation. You know, I think if I, if I had too clear of an idea of what I wanted them to be thinking about, um, I think I, 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 I feel like I wouldn't be having the, the conversation with the audience. You know, that's up to them. I want to hear, I want to know what they, like I said, I, I, I feel like with Nope, we, uh, you know, we, we described a, a feeling and we portrayed a feeling and we brought a sense of magic and adventure out of what was a very dark place and, and very dark time. And um, so I, I, I hope that they are, I hope they're just fulfilled yeah. and, and glad they went out to see it at an IMAX, which by the way, IMAX. 
You used IMAX cameras for this, I read. Oh, yeah. We used IMAX cameras. Again, very expensive. Oh, very expensive <laughs> stuff. You can't do it, you know. But it makes, it, it, it's, I think it's the best way to watch the film. Yeah. Um, and, the, you know, the, the, the format is just immersive. It is. The whole thing with me is like, I wanted to make a flying saucer movie because I just felt like if we can feel like we are in the presence of something other, something, if we feel like that's real, then that's just an immersive experience worthy of, of going to the movies. When you get out, it came out, I read that the, at the time you said you had three or four more films like that, in the, of the horror genre. You had three of those, four of those, you had them in your pocket. But as you sit here now, you, you, you say there, there, there are more. So you weren't supposed to say it? Oh, 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 no, oh. Yeah. I'm kidding. Did I, did I give it away? Oh, no. No, you good, you good. <laughs> Look, I've got more. I, I'm not gonna have just one more film. Okay. I've got more now. No, of, it's- Of the horror genre. You know, it, it, it's funny, you, you bring up the horror genre. I would say yes, because I'm always gonna be having, you know, scary things yeah. in my film, but I do like this, you know, I, I, I do like expanding. And I, I, I like working with the comedy. I like working with the adventure. Yeah. You know, I, uh, you know, genre is a thing to subvert. You like to bend the genre. Yeah. It's funny you mentioned that because there were a few times last night where I thought, yeah, this is this is this is funny. This is thrilling. This is. Do you consider this a horror film? Well, like I said, I, you know, I think it's it's no. I, I I do consider it a horror film, in that horror is, it's my favorite genre, and I I hope it it it, it honors horror. I hope it's scary enough yeah. to um, make people say talking about nope. Um, you know, at the same time. I, uh, yeah, I want, I want people to feel some other things besides fear as well. Let's put it that way. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. We will meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Hey, who's this? It's a can't-miss summer on today. Ah! They are walking strong, elegant, and pretty easy to prepare. How to cut costs on your vacation. Vicki has the answers. Every single thing you need for the best summer yet. Only on today. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks. It's not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Welcome back to you today. we got a lot to celebrate yes. on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody good, and that's it! Yeah. It's hard to believe Kiki Palmer is only 28 years old since her acting debut in Barbershop 2 nearly 20 years ago. Kiki has appeared in more than 60 TV shows and movies. Kiki starring in Jordan Peele's thriller, Nope. She plays Emerald, who may have captured footage of a <laughs> UFO, which she and her brother are hoping to cash in on. Take a look. We don't just go for the quick cash in, okay? We, we go to the most credible platform to do the story. What's that, like Oprah? Yeah. Like Oprah, for example. After that, everybody won in. Well, I'm saying there's plenty of videos of flying online. I saw one the other day that wasn't on Oprah. I didn't say Oprah. You said Oprah. You love Oprah. Like, all I'm saying is all that online is fake, low quality. Ain't nobody gonna get what we gonna get. What we gonna get? The shot. What shot? The shot. The money shot. Undeniable, singular, the, the Oprah shot. The Oprah shot? The Oprah shot. Come on out, Kiki. <laughs> 
Yes. So good to We're see you so guys. We're so happy you're here. Oh gosh, thank you for having Congratulations. me. Congratulations. Good to you. You give a little French yeah. moment. Okay, first of all, you're looking beautiful. Shout out to wife, uh, Wayman and Micah and Christopher John Rogers. Yes. He's such a talent and so are you. I got thank to you. watch... <sighs> This this film, which had me like both terrified and also um, laugh, yeah, laughing. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. Mean, it, he, first of all, Jordan Peele is a crazy talent. Yes. He is. But you are effervescent in this. Oh you shine gosh. so bright. What did it feel like to be part of it? Thank you so much. I mean, it feels so much fun. I mean, obviously, I'm a huge fan of Jordan, and this is like a different type of, of film that he's done before. Yeah. Um, the, the the style is yes. just really unique. Uh, but there's always this big overwhelming message. So for me, I was just focused on making sure that I was able to, you know, do what I needed to do yeah. to get the story told. Yeah, now, a lot of what's been pointed out about this film, it's that it's about what could be. How does this come out in this film? Oh, man, you know, I think that's the whole spectacle concept, right? right? Yeah. There's something that our, our, the two lead characters, myself and Daniel's brother and sister, they discover something in the sky. Yeah. And then they're on this journey, both for different reasons, of finding out what is it exactly. You know, Daniel's character, OJ, just is curious. And then my character's kind of like, what can we, how can we get ahead yeah. of this? How can mm -hmm. we exploit this? And through that journey, it's really just kind of more so an observation of how many of us in today's society are obsessed with outside things, yes. validation, exploiting, you know, yes. getting everything on footage, you know? Yeah. So, but let's be real. Kiki's in her backyard having a cocktail with her homegirls, <laughs> and she sees a UFO. Who is Kiki calling first? Honey, aside from talking to the girls that I'm with, yeah. I'm calling my mama. You know I'm on the computer sharing on the line? Sharon, you'll never believe what I just seen. That's always what goes down. We have to talk about your mom. Uh, we have this picture of you all in front of the oh. Nope billboard somewhere. Oh my God. Oh, really? But also, I've read so much about how she sort of, there we are. Yeah. Like, how she made you feel like you could do anything. Absolutely. My mother, uh, my family has, uh, they've been such a great support system for me. And my mom specifically, you know, she and I both were always on this kind of road together. You know, thick as thieves, yeah. uh, battling throughout every ups and downs of this industry. Yeah. And so just for us to continue to have these new moments, even after 20 years, I think it just, it, we're just feeling so blessed. I read your glamour cover story, which was so oh, profound, because you beautiful. talked about saying no. Yeah. And the power of it. And, and we, yeah. and and also, like, that you feel comfortable now being like, listen, like, I'm going to put up my own boundaries. Yeah. Like, how does that, ch how does that change? I think it could just get hard for us, right? I mean, especially as a child entertainer, you yeah. just always want to be so agreeable. Yeah. I think, you know, I think it's a part and of... And a woman. And, you know what I mean? I think it's a part of maturing and saying, it's okay to say, no, I can't do this. And it's, it's, it's like a big part of self-love and also knowing that you can give your best. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, I think that's the way that I help myself transition to understanding that it's okay to say no is that at the end of the day, all I want to do is do my best. And if I'm giving too much and I'm spread too thin, then how can I give yeah. my best? Yes. So that really made it easy for me to say, just say no, girl. Yeah. But how do you like, because I know a lot of actors in Hollywood think, go into it like, this could be the last job. Yeah. Exactly. And yes. how do you get over that fear of like, if you take a break, that it's not going to come back? Well, I'll tell you, I think it's just faith. It's faith, uh, you know, and that's something that we all are on our own personal journeys with, uh, whether it's a spiritual thing or just faith in yourself and to know that what's for me is truly for me. I remember there was something that Daniel said recently, I think it was a GQ uh, or Essence that he was talking to about how he had, you know, thought he was going to take a break from acting right before he did get out. Yeah. And he oh. took that break and then he met with Jordan and yes. ended up doing Get Out. And, you know, so I think it's, again, everybody should follow their instincts and know that if it's time for you to take a break, take a break. Just know that what's for you is always going to yeah. be for you. Yes. yes. And do you feel like, I mean, you said in, in this article that you're sort of in this next phase of your life. Yeah. Where you want to be with your nephews and your nieces. And you're thinking about, like, your personal life in a way that you've never thought about it before. Absolutely. Because, again, I started so young. It kind of the only, it, it's like a kid that starts doing football, you know, or, yeah. or basketball. Yeah. This is all I care about. Yeah. But then as time goes on, you, you the, you get more interest. You think about love. You think about family. You yeah. think about, oh, I missed the graduation. Or I missed the, mm -hmm. my, you know, so you start. <laughs> don't, no, Kiki, don't get baby fever on those kids, okay? So it's so true that yeah. you start caring about things that you really didn't, you know, you didn't yes. look at before. And I think, again, it's about balance. Yes. I think that's what I want more than anything in my life, you know, is to have the balance of, of all the things I want. Yeah. Ooh, so you're going to show us a picture of that man <laughs> in the commercial break. <laughs> oh, my God. What you going to do, guys? It's so <laughs> oh my much God. fun. Hey there, everyone.
everyone, and welcome to Pop Star Plus. I'm Joe Fryer, filling in for Carson once again. Coming up on the show, Bonnie Hunt. She's doing it all as director, writer, and executive producer of a new series out this week. We've got her visit with our third hour friends, plus Euphoria, the buzzy show about a group of troubled teens, raked up 16 Emmy nominations this year. We spoke with the cast about how their characters evolved this season. And we'll wrap things up with the late, great James Caan from our vault on one of his most iconic films, Misery. But first, here's today's pop start with Jacob. Let's do some pop start. All right, first up, we've got an exclusive first look at the upcoming Princess Diana documentary, simply called The Princess. The film's going to give viewers an intimate look at Diana's life and how her relationship with Prince Charles came under intense scrutiny from the media and the public. Watch us. The princess has been the best thing to happen to the monarchy in centuries. Did you get a chance to see her? Yes! Diana is very big news everywhere. She's got the common touch. The prince realizes that he's taking second place. By the way. <laughs> a hollow and tormented marriage are giving the British media and its public little else to talk about. Please give me one question, right? No. She's been pushed from the word go. It's the media that's causing the problems. Please. Leave them alone. Should this mean so much to us? Can't sweep her under the carpet. It's the cool. Intense, right? Ooh, I have anxiety. Wow. I know. Wow. I can't wait to watch that one. So, Prin Princess premieres on HBO the 13th of August. Okay. So, can't wait for that one. Yeah. Uh, coming up next, uh, any Dawson's Creek fans? Yes. Raise your hands. I love the Dawson's Creek. Uh, we got some news on a possible revival of the popular 90s teen drama that starred Katie Holmes and James Vanderbeek, Michelle Williams, Joshua Jackson. The news is, this is not fair, it's likely never going to happen. <laughs> Why Sorry. Bring it up? I don't know. I just wanted to let you guys know. Uh, Holmes was asked whether she would like to return to the role that made her a household name. She had some disappointing news for fans. This is what she said. I think it's great that you're nostalgic for it. So am I. But it's like, do we want to see them not at that age? Mm. I don't know. I don't think so. We all decided we don't, actually. Okay, there you go. Pretty That's pretty definitive. Definitive. I don't want to know what happened to them, like, as adults. Did you love Katie Holmes? Oh, my Come gosh. on. Yeah, yeah. Is that was your crush? crush. I would go that over your crush. I'd be like, what is happening? <laughs> <laughs> it was so good. Uh, okay, next up, Lizzo. Uh, how was the show? It was an inc absolutely incredible. Fresh off uh, being here and her hit song about damn time, hitting number one on the Billboard Hot 100. The music superstar is revealing just how many times she recorded that song's chorus to make it Perfect. She posted a TikTok video of the moment that she nailed it with members of her team celebrating. Check it out. Huh. The moment I finally figured out the chorus to about damn time. Let's celebrate. I got a feeling I'm gonna be okay, okay. That's so cool. <laughs> Is that amazing? Oh, that's awesome. Is that amazing? That's so fun. she wrote in the caption, we literally had 50 versions of this song. I never thought we'd finish it, oh. but it was worth it. Can you imagine being in that room? Do you remember when she was here, I won't forget, when she was greeting all the people in the crowd and this little girl looked at her and said, I love you, Lizzo. And Lizzo said, I love you. But do you love you? Oh. oh. She said, yes. I was Whoa. like, I love that Lizzo. Oh She's amazing. Gosh. I bet that kid will never forget that moment. Yeah, I, had, I was texting all of you. I had fun about that day. That was yeah. like, that's a good one. Also, the here. entire yeah. album is great. Yeah. That is great. Album yeah. every track. Well, if it wasn't enough, she also showed a video uh, showing off a bouquet of flowers, by the way, that Harry Styles <gasps> sent her way as a congratulations Aww. for about damn time. It actually surpassed, dethroned as it was oh, on the Billboard. Oh, his song. Yeah. Oh, that's okay. classic. I love Harry Styles. Mm -hmm. All right, coming up next, have you ever been watching Seinfeld? This is all about me, guys. <laughs> uh, and thought to yourself, boy, I wish I could have that marble rye bread or that famous big salad. Yeah. Well, now you can, thanks to the release of the official <laughs> oh, Seinfeld cookbook. No. Yes, it features recipes from some of the show's oh classic God. food moments, from the black and white yeah. cookie to the infamous soup Nazis, what? Mulligatani. Um, uh... One Malagatani, and um, you know what? Does, has anyone ever told you you look exactly like Al Pacino? You know, son of a woman. <laughs> Very good. Very good. You know something? No soup for you! Come back. One year. 
One year. One year. <laughs> one year. <laughs> no soup for you. Yosef was so excited for that one. I, just, I said Mulgatani. He's like, sign. We're doing Seinfeld. Uh, you don't have to worry about following the soup Nazis rules because you can make the Mulgatani right awesome. at home. Wow. So October cool. 11th, okay. the cookbook comes out. So That's go pick fun. that one so up. Fun. Okay. Last but not least, the most unexpected story of the morning: Aaron Rodgers <laughs> rolled into Packers training camp this week, looking like a movie, st- actually like a movie character. Look, here he is, walking into camp, rocking long hair, oh. a beard, a white tank top, light blue jeans. Does he remind you of anybody? Nick Cage. Nick Cage, Nick Cage. Nick Cage. Con Air. Packers fans and yeah. Nick Cage fans <laughs> caught on pretty quickly. He was channeling Cage's character, wow. Cameron Poe, right. from the 1997 film Con, Con Air. Yep. It was no coincidence. He posted photos of Cage on his own Instagram, too, so he did this on purpose. And it's not the first time he's done something like this. Last season, Rogers grew out his hair a lot, and it turns out it was for his Halloween costume. So he went as Keanu Reeves, uh, John Wick, complete with the dog and everything. So wow. he commits. He commits, he commits. yeah. Wow. Okay. Uh, that's your pop that's star, it. guys. Yeah, I will great. take it. I know. We were you like, want, we want, want more. more. Guys, can we get a couple more? So yeah. yeah. Hey, well, way to go. Way to go, Jake. <laughs> We've got one more pop star story for you this morning. Get ready for more Ryan Gosling and The Gray Man. The Netflix action film may have just premiered on Netflix, but a sequel starring Gosling is already in the works from the same directors. Not only that, but it seems the streamer is trying to turn this into a whole sort of spy cinematic universe with a spin-off being worked on as well. The Gray Man follows Gosling's CIA agent character as he's hunted by assassins across the globe Looks like audiences liked what they were seeing with a reported 88 million hours viewed over the weekend. That's a huge number for Netflix. And those are your Pop Start Plus headlines. Still to come, Bonnie Hunt's visit to the third hour. Stay with us. Good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. Welcome back to you today. We had a lot to celebrate on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody's good, and that's it. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Welcome back to you today. We've got a lot to celebrate on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody's good, and that's it! Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Welcome back to Pop Start Plus. Bonnie Hunt wears many hats in the new Apple TV Plus show Amber Brown. Executive producer, director, writer, and showrunner. And she dropped by the third hour to chat about the new project. Our next guest is an Emmy and Golden Globe nominated actor who has starred on the big and small screens. Ah, yes, Bonnie Hunt rolled some magical dice in the original Jumanji. Then she took multitasking to another level as a mom of 12 and cheaper by the dozen. And for her latest project, Bonnie's behind the camera directing the new Apple TV Plus series Amber Brown about a young girl navigating life after her parents' divorce. Here's a look. You sure you're fine with spending the night somewhere else, away from home, even with school the next morning? Yes, absolutely, for sure. (laughs) And I can wear these PJs that Dad sent me. (laughs) I mean, wear them, like, show up in them. Cute, right? Yes, it's very sweet. I'm so excited! Cutie. Bonnie, good morning to you. Good it's morning. so good to see you. You too, Jake. You know what I want to do? I want to say hi to Ashley first, who's Thank watching you. us right now, your niece. Yep. Say good morning to you and good morning to Ashley. We know she's a big fan. Yes, and you, she's, Ashley. you know, a cancer patient right now, my beautiful niece, and she's in the emergency room watching us because her white count is up. All the cancer patients out there know what I'm talking about when you're going through chemo and 
you have that white count go up, it's a little scary, but... Um, well, we hope we can be a yes. little hug for her in the morning. Yes, and, and, and all of you, anybody out there fighting it, you know, yeah. just know you're a warrior and um, our energy is with you, mine Absolutely. and Ashley's. That Sending lots of love to you, Absolutely. Ashley. Yeah. All right, so let's talk about Amber Brown. We're very excited. Mm -hmm. And it was based on a book series, as I mentioned, uh, a girl's going through a lot of changes in her life, including a, her parents' divorce. What else? Tell us a little more. Well, it's really about, I mean, just talking about my niece, you know, I have a bunch of nieces and nephews, and of course, I'm close to all of them. Ashley was born when I was working at Second City mm -hmm. back in the days, and uh, my whole family's been a big part of the show, because so much of it is personal for me, even though it's based on the books from Paula Danzinger. The family was kind enough to let me explore and heighten the characters and bring them into present day, and Amber, the whole show is for the whole family. Mm -hmm. um, we were talking about it before we were on the air, just, uh, Actually, I try to write from my heart and with humor, like my mom instilled in me and I it's been so much fun to kind of share my family's sense of humor and love through this series and I hope it touches it people. Comes through. We talked a little bit about your mom we're so sorry to hear of your loss I know how close you are but I know that it was important to her for you to address family different mm. issues in family and would yeah. she have just love oh, this so there's much? Mom there with is. her pies yeah um yeah, yeah. it you know I'm um I think a part of me will always be grieving the loss of my mom. Mm. Sorry. Oh. But, um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm inspired by her constantly, and she'd always talk to me about the ripple effect. You know, you're a storyteller, Bonnie. Remember the ripple effect. Be mindful, because what you put out there has an effect on people. You're doing it. So I was watching it yesterday, and it's the kind of show you can watch with your kids, and it's okay. It feels like a safe space. Yeah. Talk to me about this Amber Brown, this main mm -hmm. character. She had me at hello. Yeah. She is, I was just like, where did they find this little girl? Yeah. Well, adorable. you know, we had a great casting team, brought us everybody, and I was telling you before the break that, I mean, before we were on that um, we didn't put any descriptions of our characters you know we just said mother daughter just that kind of thing and a, and a personality and we were able to see so many people and then we you know the minute Carson was on screen my mom was actually That's her name, Carson Carson Rose so and mom and I were watching on zoom you know I was doing all the auditions on zoom at that time during right. the pandemic and Carson came on the screen and my mom and I looked at each other just when she was just talking because I always talk to the kids mm -hmm. instead of have them just read the script and yeah was, she was delightful and charismatic and authentic and she could feel the heart of the character and that Great. was most important to me and she's phenomenal Bonnie, sorry, but I got to go through your IMDb because <laughs> we've got so you many. You and every guy on the so, planet. <laughs> <laughs> so many good ones. Dave, Jerry Maguire. Yeah. Uh, you had your own TV show. You had your own daytime talk show. We were thinking, is there something? When are you going to finally you? succeed? For, oh, no, <laughs> like, give me a break. What's stick? Is there, what ties it all together for you? Ooh. Uh, storytelling and and the how magical. Uh, storytelling is when I you know I'm an oncology nurse former oncology nurse but I still work as a volunteer advocate and my time at the hospital I would see people facing their own mortalities and in a moment we would watch something on TV together and I'd see them completely free for mm. a second mm. and I realized even as a child my dad would watch the Andy Griffith show all of a sudden the pressure of having seven children and being a blue-collar guy he'd be laughing and escape right. for a moment so that's really powerful and I hope my writing whether it was returned to me which I wrote or all my talk shows or TV shows whatever it is my energy is oh can I have that effect on somebody at home right now escape. So, you right? do it's you good. do man it's great oh, to spend right time with you it's so Bonnie. great to see you here yes. yeah, Bonnie thank you so much everybody Amber Brown debuts on Apple TV plus this Friday you got to go check it out great to hear from Bonnie up next Zendaya and her euphoria castmates live from Ukraine from Uvalde Texas from Mayfield Kentucky to cover the news you have to be in it this is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. The midterms are here. It's time to plan your vote. We'll provide everything you need to know to successfully cast your ballot. Just select any state you want to learn about for the primary or general election, and you'll instantly get voting rules, see the next big deadline, and learn how to take action for your plan. Voting rules have changed since 2020, and those rules vary from state to state. So it's time to get planning for 2022. 
Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Allie Jackson now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. We are back with a fan favorite. Euphoria did especially well with this year's Emmy nominations. The show tallied 16 in all, including a Best Actress nod for star Zendaya. We spoke to her and the rest of the cast about how their high school characters navigate addiction, identity, love, and more in the most recent season. I had to choose three words to describe Euphoria. A lot of words that could describe euphoria, but chaotic, funny, and honest. Painful, tiring, love. Listen, it's a it's a very different season, to be honest. I mean, um, tonally, it's different. Um, I think it's far more emotional than the first season. Um, I think it's got much like the film stock that we use this season, which is also different. Um, it's it's high contrast, meaning the highs are high, the lows are low. And when it's funny, it's really funny. And when it's painful, it's really painful. I think uh, they're in a kind of tough position just because after they're falling out at the end of season one, Rue relapses as we find out very quickly and Jules is in, in the loop and doesn't know. While they do like reconvene, um, there's like a lot under the surface that will most likely bubble up and bring the former issues to surface again, which it's gonna be tough for them because I think like surface level feelings, they just wanna be like cute couple, but you know, it's it's more complicated than that. I think Leslie is that tough love mom. You know, she loves her girls, she'll do anything for them. And unfortunately, she finds herself in the thick of Rue's addiction. And she she wants to save her daughter. But unfortunately, sometimes those situations, the person has to make up their own mind to become sober and to become clean and to want to be better. And I think Leslie is doing everything she can. So we see her kind of make some hard decisions. And I think I think Leslie is just your ride or die mom. She's like, look, we, we're gonna we're gonna get through this together. So you slept over last night? Yeah, so? Are you two in a relationship? Mm, yeah, kinda. I think with all of the, the characters, I am um, lucky enough or blessed enough to be able to, to step in their shoes. I try to do just that. I try to become them and, and really uh, try to tell their story. But with Gia specifically, I think it's just been us kind of growing up together where I was around 15 when we were shooting the first season and now I'm 18. But there has been growth and there has been more understanding of what Rue is going through and her addiction and her mental health. But 
Gia has to realize that she is human and she has the right to not neglect her own feelings and all of this. So I think we, we get to see her grow up and I've grown up with her. So um, I've just been, been super duper grateful that I have been able to play a character um, that is so real and is so grounded and that isn't perfect. So um, I'm lucky. What if these are like the big moments in life? Like my mom always talks about how high school is like this big monumental part of her life. And I cannot imagine being 40 and looking back at this like, wow. I think one of my most favorite parts of playing Cassie, her choices are very unexpected. And I enjoy the challenge of going on a roller coaster with a character like that. So yes, it's a challenge, but I find that part the most fun. My favorite part about playing Maddie is I have a lot of fun with Maddie. I think she can be such a fun character, you know, when she's in her element and in her feminine power. I think a challenging part about playing Maddie is everything that she has to, just everything she has to go through is heartbreaking. I get a little too connected sometimes. The most challenging part about playing Ali is in the beginning, it was to not be seduced, to feel like you have to be a part of that bigger picture of the other craziness and all that. But I can actually be a bit more grounded. And I think to understand that that's my engine. It is not to play all these big notes of emotion and all that, but it's actually to be a bit more restrained. And so that was a challenge to be honest. Every actor asks, w wishes to be written with such dimension and colors and arc for a whole episode mm -hmm. and calls on their, their strengths and calls on things that they feel very close to. And I think it was this great symbiosis actually, that great gift that Sam gave me. Um, and so that's been my greatest gift. And I feel like the effect of it has been a gift that keeps on giving on how it's affecting people's lives and people saying, I feel like I'm not alone. Or I feel like you reached out a hand to me or I listen to, I watch it over and over again because it's it's going to my soul and helping me get through these dark spaces so that's the gift that i've been given it's an honor to be a part of uh, creating a piece of art and such a huge collaboration and every moving part you know it's just insane the scale of of what we're doing the tree awesome. yeah you know you can't even put that feeling into words it's incredible. I feel incredibly grateful to me when people have come up to, to me at least, and shared their stories, whether it be of sobriety or other entry points to different characters that they feel connected to emotionally. That's when I'm like, you know, this, this is worth it. Like what we're doing means something to somebody and that's all we could ever really hope for. That's the point, you know, that's the purpose. If you haven't watched or want to watch again, you can catch up on Euphoria on HBO. Still to come, we are remembering James Caan with a moment from our vault on one of his greatest films, Misery. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. And good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Man, who's this? Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts.
Welcome back to Pop Start Plus. The entertainment world was shaken when James Caan passed away earlier this month at the age of 82. Today, we'd like to remember his great acting legacy. He visited today back in 1990 to talk about his film, Misery, starred alongside Kathy Bates, who went on to win an Oscar for her performance. Over the years, the books of Stephen King have made for some pretty scary movies, among them The Shining, Carrie, Salem's Lot, Cujo, Firestarter, Creepshow. The latest edition of the list is called Misery. It opens nationwide this week. And our man in Hollywood, Jim Brown, says it brings together an unlikely mix of talents. If it were a true story, it would end up on the front pages of supermarket tabloids. Headline screaming, celebrity author terrorized by biggest fan. But it's only fiction. It's misery from the mind of best-selling novelist Stephen King and brought to the movie screen by writer William Goldman and director Rob Reiner. The romance novelist turned prisoner is James Caan, whose film credits include Cinderella Liberty, Funny Lady, Comes a Horseman, Gardens of Stone, and of course, his Oscar-nominated performance as Sonny Corleone in the original Godfather. Kathy Bates plays his number one fan, Nurse Annie Wilkes, who goes from sympathetic lifesaver to sociopathic demon. I want my pain to go away, Annie. Please, make it go away. I think it was a sadistic joke by Rob. You know, he says, let's get the most hyper guy in Hollywood. <laughs> let's get Jimmy and tie him down, you know. You know, ha, ha, ha. You know, every morning he would laugh. How, how about this scene you get in bed, Jimmy, you know. So, yeah, that's, that, it, it became, of all the, the pics I've done, and I've done a lot of physical things, you know. And I, but this was the most physical demanding, physically demanding, a picture because of that, you know, because I was forced not to move. This subject of uh, of the obsessive fan, have you ever encountered anything even remotely like this or known any actor who has? I've really not had uh, any anything remotely close to, to this or anything that touched on, uh, on violence. Plus, you know, who's going to fool around with Sonny Corleone? You know what I mean? That's the way they <laughs> hey, what are you gonna do? Nice college boy, huh? Didn't want to get mixed up in the family business? Huh? Now you want to gun down a police captain? Why, because he slapped you in the face a little bit? Huh? What do you think, this is the army where you shoot him a mile away? You gotta get up close like this, and bada bing, you blow their brains all over your nice side relief suit. James Caan was Sonny Corleone in Francis Ford Coppola's masterful version of the novel The Godfather. Caan, along with Al Pacino and Robert Duvall, were nominated for supporting Oscars, but lost to Joel Gray in Cabaret. Khan also lost out for any chance to grow old with other members of the family when his character was killed off in spectacular fashion. Now, with Coppola's Godfather III due in theaters next month, Khan, who also worked for Coppola in The Rain People and Gardens of Stone, wished the movie maker well. Oh, I have nothing but well wishes for, for Godfather III. You know, Francis uh, Coppola, of course, is been a friend for a long, long time. And uh, I always root for him. Uh, I don't think they need much help. I don't think they need my wishes even. I think it'll be just great. And there was Rocket Man trying to get out. And here comes the cliff. And just before the car went off the cliff, he jumped free. Meanwhile, James Caan has his own problems with the dilemma provided by Kathy Bates in Misery, which opens this week. Too much is to say that as they hope for an audience, Misery Loves Company. No, shouldn't do that. 56 pass. James Kahn, such a legend. We're thinking of his family and his friends. That does it for this edition of Pop Start Plus. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Join us again tomorrow for more. We'll see you then.
Oh my God, Tom, they came back. Oh, Wait, I, do you I'm, see them? I'm happy they're here. Our yeah. friends. Today, this is today in 30. It's Wednesday. Tom's in for Savannah. We're happy y'all are here. Hey, guys, we're starting the show off with a report from Tom Costello in Washington, where the Fed is set to raise interest rates again. Will this latest hike be enough to avoid a recession? And what will it mean for your bottom line? Everything you need to know straight ahead. And then we're taking you to this cool coastal island where the adorable Puffin is making a remarkable comeback. Carrie Sanders got a first-hand look. Yeah, we look forward to that. And also ahead, our friends at the Third Hour caught up with the always lovely Bonnie Hunt about her new TV series. All that plus, JBH and I were off on another adventure. This time, we are hitting one of the most iconic hot spots in New York City. Coney Island. Did you guys ride the roller coaster? You'll have to wait oh, to see. Oh, wow. Okay. Now that I've got to see <laughs> how all this works, let's get to this episode starting. It's time for Today, Today in 30. 30. We've got two reports to break it all down with everything you need to know. NBC's Tom Costello's in D.C. to get us started. Hey, Tom, good morning. Yeah, good morning. So we've been talking about this inflation problem for months, 41-year high inflation. And as you know, consumer confidence fell for the third month in a row because... Consumers are paying for inflation, of course, every single day. We do expect the Fed to raise interest rates today to try to get it under control. But is the economy close to recession? And if the Fed does, in fact, raise rates by as much as three quarters of a point, could it nudge the economy further into recession? At stake this morning, your credit card rates, new car and bank loans, even new mortgage rates are influenced by what the Federal Reserve does today. Widely expected to raise rates yet again, perhaps by three quarters of a percentage point. The fastest, most aggressive series of rate hikes since 1994. The Fed has never had to face uh, this kind of inflation battle, which is driven not by uh, an overheating economy, but an economy that's suffering from log jams tied to a global pandemic. The expected move comes as consumer confidence has fallen to its lowest level in more than a year, with Americans still paying more for utilities, clothes, food, and gas. But is the economy already on a collision course for a recession? It depends on who you ask. The most important question economically is uh, whether uh, working people and middle class families have more breathing room and they're able to afford the most important things in their lives. For Josanne English in Sacramento, it feels more like a depression. She lost her six figure salary career, then her savings and her home. Now she's living paycheck to paycheck. I don't see that there's a light at the end of the tunnel yet. I mean, I'm just struggling to get by, and it's hard to stay positive. The National Bureau of Economic Research defines a recession as a significant decline in economic activity spread across the economy, lasting more than a few months. And while overall prices are high, experts say the job market is actually a bright spot, with unemployment sitting near 50-year lows. You actually believe the economy is relatively healthy or strong right now? Yes. I don't see the big signals of recession, mainly because I'm looking at the labor market. Everybody who wants a job can find a job in this economy, and that's not typically a characteristic that you see in a recession. And that right there is why this economy is such a head scratcher for the Federal Reserve. It doesn't feel like that we are on or in a recession for most people. By the way, also watching corporate earnings, Microsoft lighter than expected on the revenue side. We did, however, hear from Coca-Cola and uh, McDonald's, both of them had surprisingly good numbers. Guys, back to you. All right, Tom, thank you. Let's bring in CNBC's Melissa Lee, host of Fast Money. Melissa, good morning. Currently, inflation's almost 9%. The Fed wants it to get down to 3%. Here we go with another rate hike. Is anything making a dent in those numbers? We have seen prices come down, uh, Hoda. I mean, we know that the national average of gasoline went from $5 to where it is right now, somewhere in the $4 range, depending on where you are. So things are coming down. The question is whether or not the Fed rate hikes have really taken effect yet. There's oftentimes a lag effect in terms of when the Fed hikes interest rates and when those uh, effects take place. And also, there's only so many things that the Fed can actually control. A lot of the factors contributing to this high inflation, uh, the war in Ukraine, COVID lockdowns, in China affecting supply chain issues, drought in the Midwest affecting farms and food prices. Those are things, last I checked, the Fed has no control over. Um, and so 
it can use the tools it has in its toolbox, but they are blunt tools. That tool is mm -hmm. rising interest rates, rate, hiking rates at this point. Yeah, and inflation, as you see, is a, is a big global problem. I keep thinking about people who are in their 60s, they're about to retire, they've planned, they've done every single thing right, and all of a sudden, here comes this big hammer and it's hitting them right now. Is there any economic advice for them? I think uh, stick to your plan if you do have that plan in place. That plan was made with this in mind. If you have a little bit longer of a time frame, um, think about getting your nest egg together. You always say save for a rainy day. The rainy day could be just around the corner because whether or not we are in a recession right now, the Federal Reserve has already told us, the American people, that unemployment will in fact tick higher. We will see more, for more uh, jobs lost here in this effort to battle inflation. So be prepared for that possibility that you could lose your job, get the six months of savings into your bank account. And keep in mind, for the longer term, stocks are the only way you're going to be able to beat inflation in terms of savings. And lastly, I keep, keep hearing this debate. Are we in a recession? Are we not in a recession? We see it every single day. But if you're Mary Smith walking down the street with your kids going to work, does it matter what they label it? Does it affect them? No. I mean, if you're paying 12 percent more for food versus a year ago, and and that 12% number, that's just a headline number. A lot of Americans are paying a lot more for particular items. A 13-ounce bag of regular Lay's potato chips, that's up 38% over the past year. So Mary Smith walking down the street is feeling it very, very deeply, much more so than the headline numbers of the government issues. All right, we'll see what happens here with the rate hike today. Melissa Nasdaq, thank you so much. In case you have not been glued to your phone lately, you may not have noticed, but the world of social media is undergoing some really big changes. Facebook and Instagram are testing moves that will allow them to compete better with the Internet's fastest rising star, TikTok. Our tech correspondent, Jake Ward, is here to break it down. Good morning, Jake. Jake, this is a huge deal. Good morning. That's absolutely right. I mean, from 2019 to 2021, TikTok went from 500 million users, that's pretty impressive, to over a billion, a startlingly fast rise. Now, Facebook and Instagram have clearly noticed, and now they are chasing its success, which means the social media that you are used to, well, it may never be the same again. This morning, some of the world's most influential social media platforms responding to backlash from users, influencers, and even celebrities. Facebook has always been about friendships and connections. Instagram lets you see your friends' pictures. But now those experiences may be changing. Facebook is testing a major redesign, showing posts based on your interests and an algorithm instead of posts that connect you with your inner circle. And Instagram drawing the most attention. The app originally known for artful photos now focusing on video. Introducing a full screen feed where photos and videos take up the whole screen. And including recommendations of other users' posts in your feed as well as friends and contacts. Now, powerful users are pushing back. While people love video, they kind of say there's like a time and a place for that. Some point out the app now feels more like TikTok, the trend-setting platform popular with younger users. Kylie Jenner and Kim Kardashian, who hold some of the most popular Instagram accounts, both reposted this meme to their hundreds of millions of followers, imploring the platform to stop trying to be TikTok. User reaction was so strong it forced Masseri to respond. There's a lot going on on Instagram right now. We're experimenting with a number of different changes to the app. And so we're hearing a lot of concerns from all of you. I need to be honest. I do believe that more and more of Instagram is going to become video over time. An Instagram spokesperson stressing to NBC News, the changes are, quote, just a test, and that Instagram is still where your friends and interests meet to push culture forward. But that may be part of the problem. In a lot of ways, Instagram has made the same mistake that Facebook made, which is trying to be too many things to too many people and losing focus along the way. TikTok was the most downloaded app in 2021 and through the first quarter of 2022, a growth largely fueled by Gen Z users born in the late 1990s and early 2000s. TikTok is so attention grabbing that after too much scrolling, it actually encourages some users to take a break. Meta, formerly known as Facebook, seems to want to be that captivating, but it faces a dilemma. Stay relevant or stay true to what it was. We've heard people say, I want Instagram to be Instagram. I want Facebook to be Facebook. 
Now, something to note here, as Facebook rolls out its changes later this year, the company says it will provide a way for users to still see all those updates from family and friends chronologically in a separate feed. Now, Facebook has not responded to our request for comment. I think anybody who has Instagram has seen, like, suddenly your feed went to the people you know and love yeah. to, like, a ton of other people. That you don't know. You and you're this, constantly, you, know. like you might this. like that, Xing it out. So people are complaining about what's going on, people who love the old Instagram. Yes. Is there any way that Instagram's going to say, okay, Okay, maybe you were right. Let's go back to the way it was. You know, so Adam Masseri comes out, the head of Instagram, comes yeah. out and says, you know, we're going to respect the heritage of Instagram, which was photos, <laughs> right? And he uses the word heritage. Yeah. You know, but but you have to keep in mind, right, that these are companies and they yeah. are about growth. Yeah. And they have seen this other company, TikTok, come up with this entirely yeah. different model. Yeah. And their model is teaching us to perform for strangers is oh, really what TikTok is about. Yeah. And it seems like that is where these others are going to go. And that's going to transform a whole generation's worth of behavior. Here's what makes me notice or nervous. I find myself at night before I go to bed, I'll say, let me just see what's going on. Right. Yeah. I'll keep scrolling, yeah, it's oh, the most especially on Reels. Feature. It's the most addictive so feature. I'll just admit right here, uh, you know, uh, I am one of those TikTok users who gets so sucked in that I literally get a video that says, you should go to bed now. From what? TikTok, it says, stop. Who You've do they give that long. to? How long? <laughs> I'm in the top, on. whatever that is, 1% oh, or whatever that goodness. is. And that is just how compulsive it is. And that's why, of course, Instagram and Facebook are looking at this and say, we need to be just that captivating. Jake, well. the first step is admitting you have a problem. <laughs> this is what I do. <laughs> <laughs> this is what I do. I have it's for your problem. job. You're doing it for your yeah, job. Yeah, yeah, Don't right. forget, for your job. All right, Jake, thank you. Welcome back to you today. we got a lot to celebrate on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody's good, and that's it! It's a can't-miss summer on today. Bam! They are walking strong, elegant, and pretty easy to prepare. How to cut costs on your vacation. Vicki has the answers. Every single thing you need for the best summer yet. Only on today. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. All right, we are back now with our ongoing series, Today Climate. This morning, a comeback story in the making. Yeah, last year, things were not looking very good for, for puffins, but the Atlantic puffin you see right here appears to be making a triumphant return. That's great news. NBC's Carrie Sanders visited one of the five islands off the coast of Maine where you'll find puffin colonies, and he joins us now from Sandy Point State Park in Maryland with the details. This is good news, Carrie. It is. Good morning, guys. Look, we're here. This is a popular place for bird watchers to come to see the coastal birds. But indeed, this is a story about Mother Nature overcoming changes to the climate. So we're talking about the puffin, that iconic bird, which, you know, is on hats, makes for little popular toys, and of course is even sold on shirts. But in real life, they've been having a little bit of a struggle, especially last year. But this year, they appear to be making a comeback, in part because of some protected islands off the coast of Maine where they are thriving. The Atlantic puffin, one of nature's rare and beloved species. And to get this close up to these remarkable seabirds in the state of Maine first requires an adventure. Our journey begins with Don Lyons, it's isolated. who runs Audubon's Puffin Project. It's a bumpy eight miles east into the Gulf of Maine to eastern Egg Rock Island, the southernmost puffin nesting grounds. Push off, here we go. 
so I can smell that this is Bird Island. Yeah. Once on the island, we're greeted with nature's chaos. So this is incredibly active here. What are we seeing? We have common terns and arctic terns. Terns and other seabirds share the island with the nesting puffins that we've come to see. We're seeing adult puffins. Adult puffins. It's hard to look away. I don't know whether it's just me. I look at a puffin and I kind of want to giggle. I mean, it looks like it's a, a toucan and maybe a penguin. It is not just you. Almost everyone finds puffins adorable, really intriguing, fascinating. Even me, I'm a data-driven scientist, but I love looking at puffins. Three months in, four research biologists have camped here with a laser focus on the puffins that are now prospering. OK, if I join you. From the blinds where biologists observe feeding patterns, a slight shift this year over last year. It was a big worry. A prolonged heat wave here had warmed the ocean. So when adult puffins fed their chicks, they hunted fish not usually found in these cold northern waters. The butterfish. When puffins bring back butterfish, the chicks can't swallow that down very easily. Because? Because they're so big and they're so round. <laughs> Adult puffins this year are finding the food chicks prefer, which are thin-bodied herring. But they're farther from shore, and when nearby, they're deeper, where the water is colder, as much as 50 feet down. They fly underwater. They use their wings to propel themselves both in the air when they're flying and when they're swimming underwater. And they're chasing the fish? They chase down fish and grab them with that impressive bill. And the burrows go quite far back. This year, some good news. The chicks, which have and burrow deep between the rocks appear to be on the rebound. What do we have here? This is actually a baby puffling. Uh, puffling? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Their term for a baby puffin. Can I touch? Yeah. Oh, so soft. This hatchling, about 10 days old. It's actually really promising. You're hopeful. I, I am. Hopeful, despite climate change, say researchers, because protected island habitats like this give puffins the opportunity to thrive. With their black and white penguin-like bodies and their colorful parrot-like beaks, the puffins are living up to their nickname, the clowns of the sea. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, top story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. The midterms are here. It's time to plan your vote. We'll provide everything you need to know to successfully cast your ballot. Just select any state you want to learn about for the primary or general election, and you'll instantly get voting rules, see the next big deadline, and learn how to take action for your plan. Voting rules have changed since 2020, and those rules vary from state to state. So it's time to get planning for 2022. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today. For breaking news in our changing world, Download the NBC News app. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. Let's go. This is a critical choke point for this fire. And good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it.
next guest is an Emmy and Golden Globe nominated actor who has starred on the big and small screens. Ah, uh, yes, Bonnie Hunt rolled some magical yeah. dice in the original Jumanji. Then she took multitasking to another level as a mom of 12 and cheaper by the dozen. And for her latest project, Bonnie's behind the camera directing the new Apple TV Plus series Amber Brown about a young girl navigating life after her parents' divorce. Here's a look. <laughs> You sure you're fine with spending the night somewhere else, away from home, even with school the next morning? Yes, absolutely, for sure. <laughs> and I can wear these PJs that dad sent me. <laughs> I mean, wear them, like, show up in them. Cute, right? Yes, is <laughs> very sweet. Oh, I'm so excited. Cutie. Bonnie, good morning to you. Good it's morning. so good to see you. You too, Jake. You know what I want to do? I want to say hi to Ashley first, who's Thank watching you. us right now, your niece. Yep. Say good morning to you and good morning to Ashley. We know she's a big fan. Yes, so you, she's, Ashley. you know, a cancer patient right now, my beautiful niece, and she's in the emergency room watching us because her white count is up. All the cancer patients out there know what I'm talking about when you're going through chemo and you have that white count go up, it's a little scary, but... Um, well, we hope we can be a yes. little hug for her in the morning. Yes, and, and right, all right. of you, anybody out there fighting it, you know, yeah. just know you're a warrior and um, our energy is with you, mine Absolutely. and Ashley's. Sending good. lots of love to you, Absolutely. Ashley. Yeah. All right, so let's talk about Amber Brown. We're very excited. Mm -hmm. And it was based on a book series, as I mentioned. Uh, a girl's going through a lot of changes in her life, including a, her parents' divorce. What else? Tell us a little more. Well, it's really about, I mean, just talking about my niece, you know, I have a bunch of nieces and nephews, and of course, I'm close to all of them. Ashley was born when I was working at Second City mm -hmm. back in the days, and uh, my whole family's been a big part of the show, because so much of it is personal for me, even though it's based on the books from Paula Danzinger. The family was kind enough to let me explore and heighten the characters and bring them into present day. And Amber, the whole show is for the whole family. Mm -hmm. um, we were talking about it before we were on the air. Just uh, Actually, I try to write from my heart and with humor, like I, my mom instilled in me. And I, not. it's been so much fun to kind of share my family's sense of humor and love through this series. And I hope it touches it people. It comes through. You talked a little bit about your mom. We're so sorry to hear of your loss. I know how close you are, but I know that it was important to her for you to address family, different mm. issues in family. And would yeah. she have just loved oh, this so much? Oh, there's mom with is. her pies. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. It, you know, I'm, um, I think a part of me will always be grieving the loss of my mom. Mm. Sorry. Oh. But, um... Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm inspired by her constantly, and she'd always talk to me about the ripple effect. You know, you're a storyteller, Bonnie. Remember the ripple effect. Be mindful, because what you put out there has an effect on people. You're doing it. So I was watching it yesterday, and it's the kind of show you can watch with your kids, and it's okay. It feels like a safe space. Yeah. Talk to me about this Amber Brown, this main mm. character. She had me at hello. Yeah. She is, I was just like, where did they find this little girl? Yeah. She's well, adorable. you know, we had a great casting team, brought us everybody, and I was telling you before the break that, I mean, before we were on that um, we didn't put any descriptions of our characters you know we just said mother daughter just that kind of thing and a, and a personality and we were able to see so many people and then we you know the minute Carson was on screen my mom was actually That's her name, Carson Carson so Rose cute. and mom and I were watching on zoom you know I was doing all the auditions on zoom at that time during right. the pandemic and Carson came on the screen and my mom and I looked at each other just when she was just talking because I always talk to the kids mm -hmm. instead of have them just read the script and yeah she was delightful and charismatic and authentic and she could feel the heart of the character and that Great. was most important to me and she's phenomenal Bonnie, sorry, but I got to go through your IMDb because <laughs> we've got so you many. You and every guy on the so, planet. <laughs> <laughs> so many good ones. Dave, Jerry Maguire. Yeah. Uh, you had your own TV show. You had your own daytime talk show. We were thinking, is there something When are you going to finally you? succeed? Oh, no, <laughs> Give me a break. What's going to stick? Is there, what ties it all together for you? Ooh. Uh, storytelling and and the how magical... Uh, storytelling is when I you know I'm an oncology nurse former oncology nurse but I still work as a volunteer advocate and my time at the hospital I would see people facing their own mortalities and in a moment we would watch something on TV together and I'd see them completely free for mm. a second mm. and I realized even as a child my dad would watch the Andy Griffith show all of a sudden the pressure of having seven children and being a blue-collar guy he'd be laughing and escape right. for a moment so that's really powerful and I hope my writing whether it was Return to Me which I wrote or all my 
talk shows or TV shows, whatever it is, my energy is, oh, can I have that effect on somebody at home right now? Escape. You do, you do. Man, it's great oh, to spend time with you. It's so Bonnie. great to see you here. Yes. Yeah, Bonnie, thank you so much. Everybody, Amber Brown debuts on Apple TV Plus this Friday. You got to go check it out. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Good evening from New Orleans. Nice to go really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. Hallie Jackson now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. It's a can't miss summer on today. They are walking strong, elegant, and pretty easy to prepare. How to cut costs on your vacation. Vicki has the answers. Every single thing you need for the best summer yet. Only on Today. Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Ah, oh, the ocean waves, the warm sand, a bustling boardwalk. There's nothing like summertime at the beach. It's true. So Hoda and I hopped in our pedicab at the world-famous Coney Island in Brooklyn to surprise some unsuspecting beachgoers with a little wheeling, wheeling and dealing. We're at Coney Island. Coney Island is historic. Yes. I mean, people have come here for generations. If you were alive in the 1800s, this is where you'd, you'd be. You'd hang here. We're on the boardwalk, which is packed with families and people. They're about to get something much better than all that. Yeah. Forget the terrifying ride on a roller coaster. What? You want to you know, know why? Why? Because we're wheeling and, and dealing. Oh, yeah. West Virginia. All right, okay. y'all ready to play? What is the nickname for the popular summer clothing trend <laughs> that stems from Nancy Meyers' looks? Beachy bohemian or coastal grandmother? Come on, uh, you know it. Coastal grandmother? Coastal grandmother! Oh! We are giving you a Coney Island staple. You guys get to go have lunch. And Nathan's famous. famous hot dog. We love oh, you. Yeah. We saw Hoda and Jenna coming on this fight. Uh, I think we went. Woo! <laughs> what are your names? I'm Hilda. Yeah. Hi, Hilda. Rod. Hi, Rod. Hi, Miriam. Hi, Hi, Miriam. Guess how many Grammy Awards Lady Gaga has? 10, 13, or 15? I'm going with lucky 13. Yeah! yeah. 13 is my lucky number! Yeah. You are getting tickets to the Cyclones baseball game! Woo. Woo. We get to go home with all kinds of fun stuff. Turned out to be perfect. Yeah, it's a great day. <laughs> oh my God, look at that thing. No, it's like Absol a bunch of Oh my God, they go down straight space. Oh, Wheeling and dealing. Let's go. Can we give you an early anniversary present? Yes. We would like to send you to Chicago. Are you okay. kidding me? And not just the two of you, six tickets to Chicago. Oh, thank you. That's great. Is that a cool that idea? Is yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, guys. Hey, y'all. What are y'all's names? My name is Bronte. Yeah. And I'm Rama. Where are you guys from? Here. We're from Brooklyn, New York. Just came here to get some sun. Yeah, have, a, have a hot dog, ride a ride. Yeah. Do what you do. All right, we got a question if you want to wheel and deal. Okay, ready? As it was, Watermelon Sugar and Adore You are all hit by what singer? Harry Styles. Yeah! yeah. You guys are going to the Statue of Liberty. Oh, it yes, baby. Huge, oh, it's so worth it. You'll board the city experience, the statue. You're going to Ellis Island. You got your torch. Yes. Y'all enjoy the New York experience. Go, 
folks, come on up. Are you guys ready? Yes. What is the adaptation of The Wizard of Oz that was filmed here at Coney Island? Was it The Wiz, Journey Back to Oz, or Wicked? The Wiz. Oh, yes! All right. You guys get lunch at Nathan's famous hot dog and, and restaurant. And we got hot dog right hats. Here. Okay, go enjoy it. Y'all look so cute. Thank you, guys. Which famous director went to high school in Coney Island? This is so weird. Is it Jordan Peele? Is it Spike Lee? Or is, or is it, it Steven Spielberg? Spielberg? Spike Lee. Yes! yes! Is that crazy? You guys yes. are getting summer concert tickets to the Jones Beach concert venue, and you get to pick whatever concert you want to go to whenever you want to go, whenever they're playing, okay? And up to six tickets so y'all can all go and bring two friends. <laughs> See you later, Coney Island! Bye, we love you. <laughs> okay, you so want to come back tomorrow. You know why? We've got Grammy winner oh. Maren Moore. She's going to treat us to an amazing concert, a rare Thursday concert on That's the plaza. That's going to be amazing. We'll see you then. There are dozens of Chinatowns all across America. With interesting architecture, diverse restaurants, and specialty shops, it's no wonder they're popular with locals and tourists alike. They also provide places for new immigrants and for families to create communities. But with gentrification and all sorts of problems from the pandemic, it's no wonder that all these Chinatowns are rapidly changing. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're gonna learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. Okay, so it's no surprise. There's incredible food to be found here in Manhattan's Chinatown, folks lining up all the time. But there used to be Chinatowns in cities and towns, big and small, all across this country. In fact, the longest running family owned Chinese restaurant is in a place you might never think of, Butte, Montana. At the turn of the century, Butte, Montana was a bustling mining town the invention of electricity leading to a demand for conductors like copper. Mining boomed, the city flourishing. The demand for labor brought thousands of immigrants to Butte. They came from so many different countries, including Italy, Ireland, and China. It was the classic portrait of the American West, with gambling, saloons, even a red light district. By 1914, Butte's Chinatown was thriving with over 60 Chinese-owned businesses. Now we're going to prepare broccoli beef. My name is Jerry Tam, and I'm the owner of the Pekin Noodle Parlor. The Pekin first opened as a tobacco shop and casino run by Jerry's great uncle, Hum Yao. Two years later, Hum adding a restaurant, and the Pekin Noodle Parlor was born. Now this building has three different levels. The top level, obviously, is the Pekin Noodle Parlor. And then the second level on the main street used to be a herbal medicine shop. That shop was run by Jerry's great-grandfather, Tam Kuang Yi. And it's crazy to think that, you know, everything came over from China at one time. Like, they didn't make soy sauce in America. The noodles were fried and brought over on ships because they didn't make fresh noodles. So the history of this place really holds true that this is a Chinese restaurant, you know, from Chinese immigrants. I met up with culinary historian Grace Young to learn more about America's earliest Chinatown. Where was the first Chinatown and how did it get started? The first Chinatown is San Francisco. The first Chinese came to California uh, for the gold rush and that was 1848. And uh, they came because America needed cheap labor and so from Gold Rush, they ended up doing farming, mm. manufacturing, and then eventually they worked on the Transcontinental Railroad. And the first Chinatown formed because America wanted cheap labor, but they didn't want the Chinese to live with whites. So they were ostracized from white communities. So t talk to me about that first wave of, of Chinese immigration to the U.S. The Chinese came from southern China, from principally from the area of Canton, 
and there was tremendous prejudice against mm -hmm. the Chinese. They were lynched, and because the Chinese were willing to work for lower wages, they were seen as the reason why Americans were suffering so much. So the blame mm -hmm. was unfairly placed on the Chinese. In 1882, Congress signed the Chinese Exclusion Act into law. It banned Chinese from migrating to the U.S. It marks the only time in American history that an entire race or ethnic group was banned from immigrating. But the interesting thing about this Exclusion Act was that there was actually exemption for Chinese tourists, students, teachers, and also merchants. A landmark court case in 1915 classified Chinese restaurant owners as merchants. And it gave them a way to circumvent the Exclusion Act of 1882. It was this exemption that allowed Jerry's great uncle to open Pekin Noodle Parlor in Butte, paving a path for more family members to immigrate to the U.S. and help the business. Jerry's father, Danny Wong, arrived in the U.S. in 1947 as a teenager. Ever since he was 14 years old, he's been working at the Pekin Noodle Parlor, and he just started with the simple rolls of washing dishes, and then he learned how to cook, and then he slowly just started integrating himself into, you know, managing it and working with the waitresses and the staff. Danny taking over the restaurant in the 1950s, spending years turning it into a pillar of the local community. Well, I've been coming here for at least 50 years, and they give me plenty of food. I never walk away hungry. I love coming to work because of all the people I work with. Like, they choose really nice people. And I mean, my father probably employed over 10,000 people at this, you know, throughout his whole entire life. So it's interesting to know that there's nearly five to six generations of people that, you know, have worked here. The menu at Pekin Noodle Parlor hasn't changed much over the years. We do a thing called chop suey. And what chop suey is, is tidbits of leftover uh, vegetables that were kind of mixed together in its own gravy and served on top of chow mein noodles. We've been serving it for over 110 years. Chop suey is in large part why Chinese food became so popular across the United States. Chop suey was the first time America experienced a culinary craze, a food craze. Mm -hmm. And it's starting at the end of the 19th century that there are Americans who are venturing into Chinatown. The way they got them to even experiment with Chinese food was to make a stir fry that was actually quite bland. Mm -hmm. So they used bamboo shoots, water chestnuts, onions, uh, oftentimes there was celery. For many years, Chinatowns were the only places where non-Chinese Americans could sample Asian flavors. Americans were going into Chinatown, some were curious. They wanted to experience curio shops, Chinese operas. With increased tourism, Chinatowns and large cities grew. But it was a different story in Montana. Like many mining towns, Butte lost many of its workers as production slowed in the 1950s. Once the copper ran dry, then the people just started to pick up and just kind of move on, move on and move back to their families and the bigger states. As miners left Butte for new opportunities, its Chinatown disappeared. In the early 1900s, there were seven chop suey restaurants listed in the Butte City Directory. Today, only the Pekin Noodle Parlor remains open. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Uvalde, Texas, a small town that has become yet another landmark. How long do you think it took for all this damage to occur? You tell us what, what it was like? With our NBC News exclusive.
cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Top Story with Tom Hamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. It's a can't-miss summer on today. Ah! They are walking strong, elegant, and pretty easy to prepare. How to cut costs on your vacation. Vicki has the answers. Every single thing you need for the best summer yet. Only on today. Jerry Tam runs the Pekin Noodle Parlor in Butte, Montana. People may know this is the oldest Chinese restaurant in America, but below it is so much history. Despite Pekin's historic status, Jerry says he was never pressured by family to join the business. I never learned to cook until I came back, uh, back in around 2009, because like any Asian American, my parents wanted all of their kids to go to college, so we all went to colleges around the nation and to get a better education, to become a lawyer, a doctor, and what have you. But I went into fashion, and what was great about that is I got to see the world because of it. In 2004, Jerry even appearing on Bravo's Project Runway. But a few years later, family duty calling him home. And unfortunately, my mom had a stroke, so my dad needed help, you know, taking care of her and take care of the restaurant. I think it was really hard on my father because they were in a generation where they loved each other every day, and they were just best friends. After Jerry's mom passed, Jerry and his dad began operating Pekin together. He never stopped working, so he was working here all the way until 85, until he couldn't make up the stairs anymore. My father and I spent every day together. I made sure he was, uh, he was healthy all the way till the end, the best of my ability I can do. My, my father passed in November, and it was really, you know, heartbreaking. He didn't want to say goodbye to my sisters or me or this restaurant or the community. He loved View Montana. Jerry now runs Pekin Noodle Parlor with his cousin, Nelson. Together, they're working to preserve a family legacy and keep a piece of Chinese-American history alive in an unlikely place. I've been asked the question, what is the future of the Pekin? And the best answer I can give you is, let's just keep it the same. Let's not change anything, because that's what people come here for. They need to have their parking spots, they have their booths, they have their favorite place to sit at the bar. I don't think they want any change, because this is a place that feels like home. Welcome back to you today. We've got a lot to celebrate yes. on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody's good, and that's it! Yeah. The midterms are here. It's time to plan your vote. We'll provide everything you need to know to successfully cast your ballot. Just select any state you want to learn about for the primary or general election, and you'll instantly get voting rules, see the next big deadline, and learn how to take action for your plan. Voting rules have changed since 2020, and those rules vary from state to state. So it's time to get planning for 2022. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Welcome back to you today. We've got a lot to celebrate yes. on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody's good, and that's it! Yeah. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. Allie Jackson now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. 
While New York City is home to America's largest Chinatown, the honor of the oldest goes to San Francisco, and that's where the Far East Cafe is located. It is one of the last remaining historic Chinese banquet halls. After a two-year hiatus, this celebrated venue hosted the 64th annual Miss Chinatown USA pageant, a Lunar New Year tradition. The occasion marking a triumphant milestone for the century-old institution. Bill Lee has owned the Far East Cafe since 1999. His daughter Kathy, working by his side as the manager. He brought me into the restaurant to kind of understand the roots of our culture. He wanted me to remember that, you know, Chinatown is about community, is about traditions, is about culture. For many in the community, Chinese banquet halls are more than just venues for special events. I feel that Far East is kind of like a second home for, you know, a lot of our patrons that come in because they feel so comfortable. So much history and so many memories, you know. A lot of patrons that have been here, they told me, they're like, oh, my parents had my red egg ginger party. It's very similar to like a baptism. And that was like 50 something years ago. And that history is everywhere you look at Far East. The ceilings, the, like my dad mentioned, the high ceilings, the moldings, the moldings are all original. And the lanterns were all imported from China uh, in the 1920s. So they're over 100 plus years old. For the last few decades, there were five giant banquet-style restaurants in San Francisco's Chinatown. But with rising rents and gentrification, most have since closed their doors. By early 2020, only two banquet halls remained. The Far East Cafe planned to celebrate its 100-year anniversary with a big celebration. Instead, it's now planning to close its doors. At the start of the pandemic, the restaurant stayed afloat by cooking meals for senior citizens and low-income residents in Chinatown. We applied for a PPP loan and we got over $200,000. We also received money from the feed and fuel program. Then our landlord gave us six months of free rent. Beyond COVID, a different type of virus brought more harm to Chinatowns across the country. Anti-Asian hate crimes soaring by nearly 340% in 2021. When this started happening, I felt very, very sad and also very angry because I'm like, why is this happening to Chinatown? Why is it happening to our community? You know, for these people to target elderly people, to push them down, to rob them, don't they realize that they have grandparents too, or they have parents that are that age, and if that happened to their parents, how would they feel? People saw the attacks when they watched the news and heard reports, and they got even more scared. They don't want to go out, even for special events like the Mid-Autumn Festival. We tried to invite them, but they didn't want to come. We used to be open until 10 o'clock before pandemic. Sometimes we would stay out here until midnight if we had events. Now, we can't, we can't do that. We changed the business hours to close at 7, 7.30, because safety is the most important thing. Business owners across Chinatown still face hostility. George and Cindy Chen opened China Live in 2017. We've been lucky. Uh, we've only had a couple instances where, you know, people scream uh, anti-Asian slurs. And we're concerned about our employees, you know, coming to work and and being harassed. I, I think that ignorance is uh, very unfortunate. China Live is a massive marketplace with multiple restaurants. It's in a building that once housed a banquet hall like Far East. I remember coming to a wedding here when I was in college. And there were, I think, I think literally 5,000 people in like six restaurants. But unfortunately, you know, real estate was getting very expensive. So it's not very cost effective if you don't have that business. But two years ago, the couple had to lay off 200 workers. However, with the support of partners, George and Cindy were able to pivot their business on a few fronts. We did, you know, the ghost kitchen was 
selling outside our box. So we have 10 locations in the Bay Area, from San Jose to Berkeley, and, uh, and they can order food from those ghost kitchens. Ghost kitchens prepare restaurant quality food exclusively for delivery or takeout. We sold so many Peking ducks, we didn't know what to do with all the duck fat. So what do you do? You make popcorn with it. So that's why we have a duck fat popcorn. As business picked up, China Live was able to rehire 100 workers. Despite an uncertain future, these restaurants remain hopeful that business will rebound. More police presence, people are more, as a community, standing up for ourselves, making sure that we have like the buddy system, making sure that we're together and we feel safe, that we're walking together, that we have each other's back. I mean, dining out is an essential part of life, right? I mean, one more fun is to look forward to having dinner with friends you haven't seen at a new place or an old favorite place. But some old favorites just can't be replaced. During the pandemic, many restaurants have shut down. Far East is now the biggest restaurant in Chinatown. If Far East closes, there won't be space big enough to host large events for the community. We were overjoyed having that Miss Chinatown USA event here, a press conference, and just being able to reconnect with the community. It warmed my heart. And my dad was just like so overjoyed that people were coming in just to celebrate. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. To learn more about the future of Chinese American restaurants, I went to visit Chef Lucas Sin in New York City. This savvy chef is on a mission to save mom and pop shops from closing and putting a spin on the classics. Hey, nice oh, to meet good you. To see you. All right, can't wait to yeah, talk come and in, taste. Come in, come in here, come in here. Lucas was born and raised in Hong Kong. Growing up, he had never heard of dishes like General Tso's chicken. What was your first experience with Chinese American food? Yeah. And did you go, what the heck is this? I was here for summer camp and uh, on Tuesdays, at 10 o'clock or so, right before bedtime, this van would pull up in the front of the school um, and you could pick between sesame chicken, general Tso's chicken, orange chicken with broccoli and fried rice or white rice or whatever it was. The first thought was that this is ridiculously delicious, where has this been my whole life? And the second thought is that what in the world is the difference between orange chicken and general Tso's chicken and sesame chicken? Why is there so much that I don't understand about this if last time I checked I was Chinese? Lucas actually studying cognitive science at Yale, but he always had a passion for cooking. His summers spent training in award-winning restaurants in Hong Kong and Japan. After graduating in 2015, Lucas opened his first restaurant with Yale classmate Yang Zhao. Junzi Kitchen is a fast casual chain that serves modern Chinese fare. But Lucas remained passionate about the Chinese-American cuisine he first tasted as a boy. 
So, so how did Chinese American food, the food that we have become uh, familiar with, how did that develop? How yeah. did that happen? Now, Chinese takeout is interesting, right? Because it's all over the United States. Right? So these folks come in, they yeah. Yeah. apprentice in a restaurant, right. they learn those recipes, and they then go move somewhere on else, right? To open their own exactly. restaurant. Exactly. And then their cousins come from Fujian, and then those recipes are passed on. And there's a remarkable similarity to, to, to these dishes. Despite the popularity of Chinese American food, many family owned restaurants that once dotted Chinatowns and other urban areas have been closing for years. Opening restaurants is really difficult, and running restaurants is perhaps even more difficult. These moms and dads open these restaurants so that their kids can go to university and become lawyers and doctors and television hosts and whatnot. And now that they're finally able to do that, they don't need to run these restaurants anymore, right? The li suddenly, livelihoods have changed. That's a good thing. Lucas and Young hatched an idea to help smaller businesses in 2019. Nice Day seeks out restaurants facing closure, then works with the owners to remodel the space and update the menus. The pandemic stalled the team's initial plans, but the second location in Long Island is slated to open this spring. It's important to me that these new Chinese American takeout restaurants that we're building called Nice Day work with the previous generation of owners because they have a lot of knowledge that mm -hmm. we don't. They know their customers, they know what sells, um, they know how to cook these dishes, they have recipes. You raise an interesting point, Lucas, mm -hmm. in that you talk to these retired mm -hmm. Chinese restaurant owners. I is that part of the, the, the sense of trying to memorialize mm -hmm. what could be lost? Now, preserving recipes is part of it. But the other important part is preserving the way business is done. Chinese takeout restaurants are one of the few restaurants in the world that if they're open from, let's say, 11 to 10, the work hours are 11 to 10. They don't have any prep hours. The same cooks that do the wok stir fries are also prepping during the day. It's ridiculously efficient, and it's got to do with the setup and the way that the kitchens are run. But it's also important to us that we give back to this last generation and that we can make sure that owners who want to retire can retire well and that that legacy can be preserved in a new type of American Chinese takeout restaurant. While Nice Day pays homage to popular Chinese American recipes, Lucas has been celebrated for his innovative fusion dishes. In 2021, he was named one of food and wine's best new chefs. We serve a Mapo mac and cheese yeah. here, which yeah. is a variation on that dish. It's fusion-y and it's silly and it's just an attempt to do something ridiculous. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make any sense. Um, it, it betrays every chef sensibility that I have, but unfortunately it's delicious and it's interesting and it gets people talking. Finally, it's time to eat. Lucas showing me how to make his signature dish. How do we get started? So the mapo mac and cheese, the mac and the cheese elements are rigorously American. Mm -hmm. These are, this is elbow macaroni right? uh, cooked halfway. And this is Velveeta. Um, but the mapo element is going to be in the form of a mapo sauce, if you will. The last two elements that really sort of take this over the edge is um, Chinese sausage. Oh. It, it can function like bacon and some dried shiitake mushrooms that we've rehydrated. So um, to start off with, we're just going to cut a couple of things. And this tofu we will then put into the deep fryer. Mm -hmm. This concludes the chopping portion of our program. <laughs> Next, garlic and ginger are cooked till fragrant. Then, spicy bean paste and soybean paste are added to start the sauce. Mushroom broth is added, the mixture brought to a boil so the flavors infuse. Can I give that a try? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, let's see. Here you go. So your left hand's on the walk? Yeah. Yes. I can't, I, can't, I can't get any altitude on this thing. Nothing's coming up. And that's why the pros do it, baby. At this point, everything's smelling quite good. Uh -huh. So the macaroni is going to go in, as well as the soup we just made. Once it's boiling and happy, two slices of the best of the best. Velveeta. Velveeta American cheese. Wait for that Velveeta to melt. Uh -huh. You'll see that that sauce is already beautifully tied together. We like to plate this dish in 
the Chinese takeout box. Oh wow! Because it's silly. Oh, um, why not? <laughs> it's fun. Boom. Some fried tofu puffs as croutons go over the top. That's a little bit of texture and the homage to the original Mapo tofu. These fresh scallions are actually really important because they cut through the heaviness mm -hmm. of the original dish. Wow. There's a little spice, the creaminess, the crunch of the, the tofu. I hope you get, yeah, get a little, little bit of the Chinese sausage. sausage, yeah. Whoa, you've never had mac and cheese like this. <laughs> <laughs> Amid a global pandemic, changing family dynamics, and anti-Asian racism, Chinatowns across America and the communities that sustain them face a challenging road ahead. Every business that is open right now is still fighting for its life. And I think that the best way to fight the anti-Asian hate is to show our love for the community. Come to Chinatown or your local Asian American Pacific Islander restaurant, store, market. Give them your business. We have lost so much.